morning and welcome to Sunrise. I am Alero Edu. And I'm Aya Makine. Good morning and welcome. You know, I picked this book up because you just talked about it. <laughs> My eyes just went there. Why you act the way you do? Have you read it? Many people don't even know why they act the way they do. <laughs> why do you act the way you do? You just act the way you do, that's all. Why do you steal? Um, <laughs> because I'm a kleptomaniac. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know what is right to do and you don't do it. Why? Well, so why do you act the way... That, that, that would make interesting reading, actually. So, um, <laughs> um, I had reason uh, the past few days to go take some tests on 16personalities.com. You should take that test as well. 16personalities.com. Even I amazed myself. I have been told that. I took the test twice and have been, re have been reliably informed that I'm an introvert. Oh. You are? <laughs> <laughs> you could have fooled me. <laughs> you are introvert? <laughs> wow. I'm 54% okay. introverted. Thank you very much. Okay. Yes. All right, I think I need to do the test. <laughs> I mean, if he tells me that I'm introverted, then there's something <laughs> There's certainly something wrong somewhere. <laughs> I was, my ova was gasted and my flabber was whelmed. Was whelmed. I took it twice. And it said the same thing. It said the same thing. Well, that I'm means you don't even know yourself. I don't even know myself. So I was speaking with a couple of HR persons and the first person, one of them said something that, that caught me. Said, it's possible that the reason it's like that is because what I am projecting is different from who I really am. I said, so, okay. who are you? An introvert. <coughs> 54%. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, and I wonder how many people are going to receive this very eye-opening result from this test. You should, if, you, if you answer the questions on 16personalities.com, honestly, 16 personalities. 16 personalities, one word. Okay, 16 written one out. Six. No, 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 one six. One six. Personalities, one word. Okay. All of them together. If you, if you answer those questions honestly, and you're not second-guessing yourself, uh, am I this, am I that, <laughs> you will be amazed. I was, they say I'm even a logistician. Whatever that means, right? <laughs> I give up at this point. <laughs> okay, well, well, next week you're going to tell me what you came up with. In the meantime, mm. that massive fire in Dusumu Street. I mean, from the pictures that we saw on television, one just gets the impression that um, someone should just go there and just throw a bomb in the whole place. Because the houses are built cheek by jowl. Mm. I mean, you can almost stretch your hand through the window of one house to someone in the next house and exchange gifts and all that. And somebody who lived in that area when we were growing up said she actually tried to go there on a Sunday, which is last week Sunday, and she couldn't even, she, she lived at number 40. She said she couldn't even get to number 40 because the street now seems to be a pedestrians only street. I, on the day, the, the, the day after it happened, we, we had reason to discuss it, just to mention it, you know. I, so I went on X, I was seeing some posts on X and I saw a particular video where a couple of people were trying to make sure that the fire didn't get to their house. How? Good. They were bailing water from bowls and plastics, even buckets, and pouring it on the other house's wall, which was already on fire. They even threw them a hose from the uh, fire service downstairs, uh, down on the, on the ground floor, mm -hmm. just to make sure that the fire didn't get to them. You could literally stretch your hand to get a, bo a bowl of salt and in fact, you could from handshake the from the next house. You know, you know, there's something they call difficult decisions in leadership. Yeah. That's what you just talked about now. Very, very difficult decisions. Hmm. What informed creating the new Lagos then, which is now called Surulere? What informed it at that time? Hmm. Perhaps we are getting to that 
space again. New Lagos. Secondly, mm. um, you no, remember no there comment. was... <laughs> there was such a place as Morocco at some point. At some point, In yes. our lives. Yeah. Where is Morocco now? Okay, it's on the way to Lekki. Okay. Yes. You know, I tried to locate that particular <laughs> area, which was <laughs> called Morocco. At the time. And um, I... I, re I really have not succeeded. Well, you, you, it, it'll be difficult. There is a place at, for anyone who hasn't been to Lagos in about 20 years, you got to Lagos now, you're saying you're looking for Strabag bus stop before you get to um, um, Secretariat if you're coming from Ikeja. Mm -hmm. You're looking for Strabag bus stop. It's completely, it's no longer existent. <laughs> it is now the old Strabag is what is now the Ikeja city mall. Ah. So, okay. is there such a landmark for Morocco? I don't think so. Mm. Now, that we need to have those difficult decisions taken. There is a lot of sentiments, a lot of history, emotional history, ancient history, and all of that to those places. But how healthy, how safe is it for the people? Now, that's another conversation altogether. Now, those houses that have been that have been burnt, mm. and the ones that are in jeopardy, that the state government is saying, look, they're going to have to go. Yeah. Uh, they, they have, their integrity tests no longer exist. It is one thing to say we do the needful. How do we pacify those who will be directly affected by this? Yes, yes. That's another conversation. That is the difficult decision yeah. that has to be made. And for Lagos to become a mega city, as it is claiming, those decisions will have to be made. Well, I guess it's uh, up to the Lagos State Government. I don't even envy anyone who is in leadership. I mean, cent that. Central Lagos. I mean, remember that time that I went to Central Lagos and I came and I said, oh, my God, the place was so dirty. The houses were so close together. There was smell and there was gutter everywhere. Those are the things that make Central Lagos untidy and tacky. It's, 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 and Central Lagos is... I mean, if you, if, you, if you visit Lagos and you need to go shopping, as in shopping, shop, you have to go to central Lagos. Wow. So are you going to be jumping over gutters as a tourist and all that? Lagos doesn't want to project itself as that city. Um, hold up. Hold, hold up. Hold up. Hold it. Say, hold it. No, no well, the, 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 the funky way, funkier way to say it is hold up, hold up, hold okay, up. Okay, all right. I'm holding. Yes. If you go to Bombay. In India, mm -hmm. it has those things that makes it Bombay. If you make it too modern, it's no longer Bombay. If you go to New York and you take out certain things... No, we're not saying make it modern. Mm -hmm. Make it clean. Potable water mm -hmm. is very important. When I was growing up, there were pumps, public pumps, and you could go there and do this and drink water. Yeah, how many people were in Lagos? At in the schools, you did this and drank water in primary school. How many people well, were in Lagos at the time? Okay. Yeah. So how many people have water in Lagos today? Possible water. Um, I'm even surprised and grateful. Highbrow <laughs> Ikoi does not have water, does not have water coming from a uh, utility company, Lagos Water Corporation. Most houses in VI do not have potable water coming from the state. Mm. Who has water coming from the state in Lagos? Maybe a few houses in Ikeja and a few houses somewhere God knows where else. So what happened to that uh, water corporation uh, funded uh, project? Of yes. no, I was just, I'm just saying. Anyway. Mega city loading. Well, a new Lagos arising. I think that's the campaign slogan of the Sonwolu government. Well, that's for that. What yeah. else do we have on the plate? Um, you know, this identify yourself thing, you have um, BVN, you have your NIN, you have your permanent voter card, you have your passport, and you have your driver's license. And guess what? They all have your biometrics. Mm -hmm. I am tr I'm trying to renew my driver's license right now, and I have been told that I have to come for capture. And I'm wondering, I've been captured how many times <laughs> before? <laughs> my face hasn't changed. My fingerprint hasn't changed. So why do I have to go for capture yet again? 
And anyway, these other agencies all have my fingerprints, the color of my eye, I, I, the color of my pupil, my color of my eyes. And yet they want it again. I don't this is what we're saying about harmonizing all these things so that we don't keep going and coming. If I wanted to get <clears throat> renew my passport next week, I would have to go for capture no, again. I don't think that is right. Whoever it, I don't know if you are talking to. It is true. Because <clears throat> I have renewed my driver license and I didn't have to recapture. Well, I was told yesterday I have to recapture. How old was the old one? Uh, three years. I don't think that should be it. You have all of your, the, the same data. Well, that's what the road safety officer in charge told me yesterday. Well. Not last week, yesterday. Let, uh, let them do their job and come and defend yourself. So the ball is in your court. Because I don't remember having to go back to capture. Well, I'm trying to em em envision if I had to. I'm trying to envision. Oh, yeah, 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 I did. Maybe they think that your face can change remarkably in three years. Are you Michael Jackson? <laughs> I haven't done a face job. So, anyway. Let the, the, I think they would have to, you know, explain to people so that people, people don't understand what all of that is about. And because I also, I thought, I thought you even wanted to say something else. Um, there is now a new one, I think, by the Ministry of Interior at the federal level that we needed to do some kind of, I don't remember what it is in mm. particular, some kind of three new registrations or identity cards or something like that. I don't know exactly what it is, but... New identity cards? Next N item, please. Nin. Mm -hmm. Oh, I'm done. I'm done. <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, mm. So, our uh, menu. Oh, I'm done. this is yours, I think. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> so, <laughs> that's it. The first item on the plate is Eye on Justice System Reform. Mm -hmm. mm. Naira Rebounds. Yeah, yeah. Great news. Applause. Drum roll. What next? Lancement Soil Values. I mean, what's that? Well, you find out. And then this one, do X to get Y. y. <laughs> <laughs> Are you using Pythagoras theorem? <laughs> well, you'll find out more of that, about that later. And then post-fasting workout regimen. Yes. Salah is over. Yeah. We are Lent all, is over. We all finished fast. Lent is over. So. For well, those of you okay. who jumped right into. We lost weight that time now. Did so. you? We did, since we were not eating. Did you? <laughs> <laughs> I'm just saying, because the moment some people end their fasting, <laughs> after every day, even you, you broke your fast with a feast. Uh -uh. <laughs> According to some people I know, since I have not eaten since yesterday, uh, I must eat yesterday and today <laughs> together. And I'm asking, did your stomach go bigger? Uh, We'll be right back to start the program in earnest. In the meantime, get your cup of cocoa. Oh, cocoa. And uh, we'll be right back. Just a minute. Stony water sweet, though. Eat the sweet to drink, oh. You go drink to clean out, oh. Thinking nobody go know. Now, so he be, oh. With a side piece, so pretty with hips to kill, like say nothing be sweet, pass on. fought many battles in his life but none of them was in his own house none of them was in his own house. then he go carry who no being wife all of a sudden small small family start i'm not the time i'm coming red matter absalom kill i'm not Chaos for five. This is 
Well, thank you so much for staying with us. Now, let's have a conversation around the justice sector reform. The Nigeria's administration of justice is facing many, many, many challenges. Congestion of cases in courts, delays in the prompt resolution of cases, alleg allegations of corruption in the formal justice uh, system, a punitive and retributive approach to crime with little or no room for for restitution repatriation and reparation of victims of crimes adversarial hostile and technical nature of litigation the issues are numerous now it is evident that the time has come to overhaul the country's justice sector what many have said to be overdue now, the Attorney General of the Federation and Minister of Justice, Latif Agbemi SAN, said the forthcoming National Justice Reform Summit will deliberate on draft legislations proposed to um, address some of the, 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 the challenges within the justice sector. He said the summit will be conducted in collaboration with the NBA, that's the Nigerian Bar Association, and the National Judicial Council, NJC, and it will be held in Abuja on April 23, beg your pardon, April 24 and 25. What do all these mean, really? Um, I bet you're asking. Let's have that conversation. We expect to have two senior advocates of Nigeria this morning. Suleiman Usman uh, is a former Attorney General of Sokoto State, and he joins us from Sokoto. He's right here with us, Senior Advocate of Nigeria. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. Thank you. Well, let, let, so while, we, while we expect our second guest, let's begin with you, uh, Mr. Usman. Uh, there are those who say that the, these issues are, and that um, the, the cases need to, the issues need to be resolved now or else. Tell us what the implications of these issues that have been raised are. Well, justice is the greatest interest of man on earth. It is the bond of society. It is the cornerstone of human existence. So that is why any time any reform is initiated, any time the justice system is uh, if you look at with a view to improving it, it is timely. We cannot say it is too uh, uh, soon or it should have been uh, uh, the other time. So I commend the effort of the Attorney General in trying to bring collaborative effort between the Federal Ministry of Justice, the National Judicial Council, the NBA and all the other stakeholders, perhaps the, the body of senior advocates of Nigeria should also be 
involved and the body of ventures because these are the uh, main bodies that regulates uh, the legal profession so that uh, the justice sector will be made to be responsive and it will be able to deliver justice to all manner of citizens uh, according to law without fear of evil, affection or ill will. Uh, like you've said in the background, the justice sector is bedeviled by a lot of uh, problems and, and bottlenecks. Uh, one of which is uh, the prominent of which is delay and uh, corruption. Delay uh, in the sense that if you start a case from a high court before the case is fully put to a turn arrest and ended at the Supreme Court, a normal civil matter will take an average of 20 years. Wow. So at the end of the day, whatever might come out of that will not be said to be justice. Mm -hmm. because justice delayed is justice denied. That's why since Magna Carta, chapter 40 of Magna Carta says, to no one shall we delay or deny the right to justice. So we need a timely and responsive justice system, both criminal justice system and civil justice system. And that is one where we can really uh, uh, earn the confidence of investors so that investors can come in and invest because they know that the machinery of resolution of this food is uh, uh, seamless, is not be uh, able by bottlenecks, and you can get speedy justice. Mm. Justice uh, uh, within a reasonable time, not justice at the altar of speed. Yes, sir, there are many things that Nigerians are hoping will be sorted out uh, at this summit that is about to take place and uh, some of which you have already dealt with. Among them also is um, a reform that will ensure that everyone gets justice, irrespective of their status. Because during elections, you must agree, all kind, or should I say after elections, all kinds of judgments take place that make us wonder, you know, what is going on? Is this really justice? Is this fair? So there's a lot that Nigerians are looking forward to. Well, part of the reforms that we must continue to uh, do uh, are institutional reforms. We have to look at the laws all the time. You know, laws are man-made and not perfect. And uh, most of these laws uh, uh, and even decisions are influenced by certain factors that, uh, you know, affects the decision of uh, uh, the particular judges. So that's why we need to have robust, comprehensive laws that are up-to-date, fair, and reasonable so that uh, the justice will be ensured mm. and um, assured to all citizens. You know, Mr. So Osman, in, when we, my, my in apologies. The last, uh, if, if you don't mind me butting in, sir, my, my sincere apologies. Is it a problem of the laws or the problem or the challenge of interpretation or maybe because well, for instance just a second for instance we have been told quite a number of times that there are so many cases that have backlogged over the years in the courts so many people in the prisons in their tens of thousands that should not be there simply because the law or, you know, of, of the delay in the system and all of that. So is it a problem of the law or, or the laws, the constitution, or the practice? So speak to that, first of all. Yes, the problems are both. There is problem of the law, there is problem of the practice, uh, and even the constitutional framework. You know, our constitution, you know, the history of it, you know, the history of the efforts at amending the Constitution, the various constitutional conferences, and the various amendments the National Assembly has made uh, in recent years up to the court alteration. Uh, but notwithstanding all these efforts, we still lack a very robust and comprehensive Constitution that will guarantee the uh, 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 rights of citizens. First of all, even in terms of fundamental rights, Chapter 2 is still not justiciable, and that is the one that deals with economic and social rights of the citizens. 
and that is the one that you will use to hold government accountable to ensure good governance. So there are so many things. Sorry, on that one, very quickly, uh, why is it not justiceable? Sorry, Mr. Osman, so if you can hear me. Justice Just a said. second. Why is it not justiceable? Because it has not been meant to be so by the law, the organic law itself, the Constitution has uh, uh, made provisions to ensure that it is only when it is practical. And, you know, the issue of practicability is uh, uh, subjective, that government is now encouraged to do it as a matter of uh, uh, fundamental objective and directive principle. But in other claims, not just the uh, chapter two of the Constitution that deals with socioeconomic rights, even the side generations of rights, like the right to develop, I made justiciable. Government is uh, held accountable. Now, you have to wait for legislature to legislate different aspects of the fundamental objectives and directive principles, like was done with the issue of corruption, before you can now use it to uh, uh, hold leaders accountable. So that is one area in which we have to really look at. Even our chapter four of fundamental rights, in terms of guaranteeing free trial rights, Though the Administration of Criminal Justice Act 2015 and the AGCLs of the various states, the most comprehensive of which is that of Social of 2019, has done a lot in guaranteeing also access to justice, to ensure speedy trial, to make the criminal justice response. And nonetheless, there are still so many areas that need to be improved upon. So okay. it is a work in progress. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, we've since been joined by um, Mr. Debayo Ojo, also Senior Advocate of Nigeria and former Attorney General of Oyo State. Good morning, sir. Hello. Mr. Ojo, are you there? Okay, I think he's, uh, we, we don't have him more uh, for now, but, but certainly when we have him, we'll, we'll take him back. You know, but Mr. Usman, you know, the issues are definitely varied in all of these. The question then remains, what really does it take? There are those who say that there are certain parts of our laws that conflict. And, and I think you have yes. also just said it now that there is a part that it's right there in the law, but it is, it's subjective to when whoever yes. it is that's supposed to execute it says it is. So these conflicting yes. laws, how did they come to be in the first place? And how do we ensure that it doesn't happen again? Well, uh, first of all, you know, apart from the traditional justice system, when the colonialists came, they introduced the main body of English law by ordinance number three of 1863. First to the colony of Lagos, and then after amalgamation, the whole of the Federation. At that time, uh, at, at 1916, we have one criminal legislation, the criminal court that operates throughout the Federation. But uh, after certain constitutional conferences and constitutional uh, amendments from Lugard Constitution, Clifford, McPherson, Richard, and the rest of them, the involvement of citizens ensured that the peculiarities of each sections of the country are taken into consideration. And later, in terms of criminal justice, we have to also uh, bring in the penal code for northern states and then have dual criminal justice system. Now, the system is common law, and common law is hierarchic and based on stare decisis, decisions that were done by the courts past decisions of superior for that all other courts lower in the judicial hierarchy must control and follow, uh, regardless of the nature of those decisions. So there's a lot of latitude and discretion uh, in terms of decision. So what we need to do because of our level of development and even our level of patriotism is to ensure that uh, some of this discretion are guided by legislation, given the present circumstances. And as time goes on, maybe we relax some of those uh, 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 provisions to allow for more discretion. Mm -hmm. So that is one of the reasons that these two conflicting decisions. For instance, 
Because most of those complaints are more or less in the court of appeal, where we have so many divisions. So there needs to have a mechanism whereby leveraging on technology, all justices of the court of appeal will be updated with the stations of each division real time. So that whenever a matter arises for the termination in which a division has uh, decided upon, the other division would have the leverage quickly in real time to have that decision. And also, sometimes even their conferences can be harmonized so that whenever matters of constitutional importance are to be decided by a division, other divisions can, with technology now, be brought into the picture so that a, a holistic decision will be taken to avoid some of these uh, conflicts that you have in, in, in judgments and decisions of court. And one of the reasons also is uh, corruption, mm. judicial corruption. And well, that know, is what... Uh, my apologies. You know, uh, Mr. Osman, I, I really don't envy legal practitioners. Sincerely, I mean, you have become, you have been attorney general of a whole state. So sometimes when you have to deal with some issues, you're wondering, uh, you know, there is the provision of the law and then there is the fact of whether or not it is justiciable. Sincerely, I don't envy um, those of you who have to interpret these laws to clients and back and forth. But there is one, one, one of those things that I don't know how you would interpret it to us so that people all over the country can understand. Um, for instance, there is a question I've heard a few times that there is a difference within penal code and the criminal code and that some, some are wondering why should we have um, the criminal code in one part of Nigeria and the penal code in another part of Nigeria. If you can speak to that one and whether or not that, is, that should be discussed at this Justice Sector Reform Summit. Yes, you know, criminal law usually is uh, local because it is the community, it is the government on behalf of the community that determines what is a crime. And uh, that is why in, in terms of uh, the nation, you have differences in terms of criminal jurisprudence. In the South, there are certain offenses that are uh, uh, regarded as, of, uh, as offenses in the South, but in the North, they are not offenses because of the uh, uh, influence of Islamic law and Sharia. But regardless of uh, the jurisdiction, it is the state that determine what is criminal on behalf of the citizen. And therefore, those offenses are now put into the court by way of qualification for easy understanding and for easy administration. So that is the difference. The difference is mainly in offenses that are Islamic law-based and offenses that are common law-based. Most of the offenses that are offenses in the South are still offenses in the North, largely. But where uh, Sharia Penal Court operates, Sharia Penal Court operates on Muslims and the Penal Court operates on non-Muslims. Okay. Um, Mr. The, the former Attorney General of your state, uh, Mr. Adebayo Ojo, Senior Advocate of Nigeria, is now with us. Good morning, Mr. Ojo. Good morning. Yes. Now, uh, these uh, justice reforms that we're looking at, um, what kind of things are you expecting the reforms to actually look at and achieve? Thank you for having me. First and foremost, I must uh, commend the Honorable Appointment of the Federation, Mr. Latif Sadbimi, SCA, for coming up with that great and laudable idea. So you ask me now the type of reforms that the summit to talk about it's what the Honorable General has in mind is holistic approach, is total overhauling of the entire system within the justice sector, not only about the law, the institutions that make up the 
justice sector, be it infrastructure, facilities, personnel, the law itself, and the legal framework. So it is holistic. Everything now is going to be reviewed overall um, so that they can be in tune in line with the world-based practice and with the modern reality so that Nigeria won't lag behind. Because we have a lot of uh, factors that have kept us back and which has made even the internal community to be losing faith in our justice system, so to say. Mm. But now, the Honorable Attorney of the Federation is now saying we have to look at all this and see we all know the challenges. Then, after the five challenges, how do we move forward? How do we move forward to rectify sin so that we, uh, I, how do I, how, how do I put it now? So that you can take the justice, the, the justice sector to the next level, yeah. as we used to say in the class in Nigeria. Uh, Mr. Ojo, um, after every election cycle, there's always plenty of talk that points to, um, uh, it would seem like the whole nation is questioning the integrity of the justice system in Nigeria and the integrity of those who are practicing it. Are you hoping that things will be looked at that will reduce this kind of, I would call it, um, insult, if you don't mind me using the word, that is cast on your profession after every election cycle? You see, we are just... Mr. Ojo? Yes, I'm here. Okay, I'm go you. ahead, go ahead. You see, we must not be unfair to the... Hello? We can hear you. We Go ahead. Not, we must not be unfair to the system. You see, the problem we have is largely systemic. It's largely systemic. And one cannot uh, really pigeonhole it to if... Thanks, the network is really very interesting, if I can say. <laughs> well, Mr. Usman, I don't know if you want to speak to that same issue. Interesting. Yes, well, like he said, uh, yeah. there are systemic issues that has to do with uh, post-election dispute. But largely, most of these things are also the result of manipulation by politicians. Uh, a lot of pressures have been... Uh, put on judges, and also in terms of proof, you know, when it comes to justice, it's only if you are able to prove your case that you will be entitled to judgment. Uh, legal justice is not like social justice that is even handed, that, uh, you know, come to, uh, like a coin when you, 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 you toss it off, it comes to rest on the ring. In, in terms of uh, legal justice, it's either head or tail. So sometimes allegations can be made, but when it comes to proof, there is no credible proof. And uh, the justice system cannot decide without credible evidence. And not only just the credibility of the evidence, they also the, 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 the quantum of proof, the, the degree, the standard of proof has to be there. Most of the allegations are criminal in nature, and the law says you have to prove beyond reasonable doubt. And because of the diversity, of the constituents of election, the main unit being the polling unit, to be able to prove every infraction at every polling unit, given our even infrastructural development, even ability to gather evidence, most of these evidences are lost the moment the ele election is declared. Okay. So you have to have a sort of uh, 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 mechanism whereby you will gather evidence real time at the time it's happening and you preserve it in the proper legal format. And also, you have to also plead it okay. specifically and then prove it. So, some of these technicalities 
that are also there to ensure justice are also uh, becoming a hindrance in the ability of some uh, petitioners, especially in election petition, to prove their case. Well, you know, there are so many questions to ask on that particular one. Why should we prioritize election um, cases over every other? For mm -hmm. which reason some will say there are tens of thousands of cases uh, are, are still lagging it in the It deals with course. governance. You have to have leadership okay. before you can do anything. Okay. So that is one of the reasons. But I agree that we should reform also the civil justice system. Okay. I was a member of the Legal Practitioner Disciplinary Committee between 2020 to 2023. And what we did to fast track cases before the LPDC is to uh, make sure that we adopt uh, the issue of affidavit evidence. In the civil justice system now, what we have is witness deposition, whereby even after you front load your witness the positions and documents that you need to rely in the determination of improving your case, you have to come to court to adopt. Mm -hmm. But at LPDC, by 2010 rules, 2020 rules, what we did was to make uh, intended witness to swear to an affidavit. Because well, affidavit yeah. in the service and evidence. So that even if you are not in court, when yeah. the proceedings are to be taken, it can be adopted mm -hmm. and then uh, yeah, Mr. Houseman, we could go on and on about this. Every election cycle, we talk about electoral reforms, and we're still at the same, should I say, train station. But hey, perhaps some other time we'll take that on. But we have to thank you very much this morning. It's been very, very enlightening what you've given to us. Solaban Usman is a senior advocate of Nigeria and former attorney general of Sokoto State. We've also had with us briefly, uh, Adebayo Ojo, who is also a senior advocate of Nigeria and former attorney general of Oyo State. Thank you, gentlemen, for being here this morning. Thank you so much, Vibe. Thank, Thank you. Yes, sir. So we'll be back in a moment to take on another issue of similar prominence in the course of the week. To stay with us. Thanks for calling Bastion HMO. Thank you. Now that was my health insurance partner. Yeah, I was just as skeptical as you were about health insurance until I tried Bastion HMO. I got a health care plan that's right for me and my family. I have access to top quality health care services and facilities. We also get access to over 1,700 hospitals and clinics. Call 0800 Bastion, Bastion Health, the HMO that puts you in control. The Duchess International Hospital caters to every aspect of a family's health needs. A one-stop shop for maternity and child health services, emergency medicine and critical care, medical and surgical subspecialties, dental and eye care, and a range of other subspecialties and services, all available at a single location, right here in the heart of Kedja. And it really doesn't matter if you're paying out of pocket using your HMO or private insurance. We focus completely on providing that world-class affordable health care for all the family at all times.
Which one? The blue Naira? They're the blue... <laughs> Not if you spray it. <laughs> As has been proven. One person Proof. just went in yesterday for six months, even though we keep wondering, it went so fast. It was so quick. And all those uh, other people who uh, do it uh, haven't got anything. You mean oh, he's, he, her, his, his, her. Is it? Is it she's offense or oh, his? Uh, his. Uh, this is my analysis. He must have gone to do he or she? and make up for their wives. And they have seen what <laughs> she, he, he or he <laughs> she can do. She, she <laughs> has done. Uh, uh. And then they were waiting. They could have taken decision about him at the club and said, this guy. <laughs> <laughs> The, if you look at the speed, it was so quick. Mm. Okay. We have so many issues now. That... You've already seen the faces of our guests. <laughs> but let's look, you need to meet them. <laughs> well, let me now tell you what they're here to talk about. Is actually, it has to do with the rise in value of the Naira. You noticed in the course of the week that almost every day, the Naira was appreciating as the days went by. I mean, I think yesterday it was down to 1,100 Naira, or maybe even less in some places. About a week ago, I, I checked my, one of my bank's um, um, app, up. and I saw that the Naira was exchanging for 1,180 about a week ago on a bank app mm. to the dollar. Mm. Wow. So the Naira is getting stronger. To everyone's joy. Even though our forex is our foreign, what's that thing again? Reserve. Reserve, Reserve. Reserve. is also somehow. Some well, they said they're taking some out of it. Well, we uh, it's, it's gone down a bit, but um, that doesn't seem to be affecting the value of the naira right now because the, the In fact, um, I read somewhere yesterday that the naira was the top performing currency yes, in the world. The world. Yes. I mean, and I felt. <laughs> I'm a Nigerian. Please, I take a bow. Thank you very much. So, what are the things that have happened that have caused this race of the Naira to strengthen? We have with us in the studio this morning the former chairman of the NESG, the Nigeria Economic Summit Group, Mr. Buka Kiari. He's also the co-founder of Trans-Sahara Investment Corporation. Good morning, and thank you for coming. Good morning. 
you haven't appeared physically in a long time. In a while, yes. <laughs> so we're very happy to see you with us in the studio. Uh, yeah. And we also have a lawyer and chartered accountant, our friend, Mr. Ulubenga Adeoye. Good morning. Thank you. Good morning. It's a oh, thank pleasure you to be very here. much. Chartered accountant, lawyer, all rolled in one. <laughs> thank you. Let me start with you since we haven't seen you in a while. Mm. So, what are the things that happened that suddenly caused this race of the Naira to become stronger? Yes. Um, big, big, strong, and reliable. Or is it a magic wand? Uh, well, it's uh, YC's magic wand. Uh, by YC, I mean uh, the central bank governor. Oh. Uh, Yemi Kadroso. Um, he, he, uh, I, I think it's um, in the last two MPC meetings, they've raised interest rates by about 600 basis points, which is 6%. So, uh, and, and remember, he came into the office in September. Mm. From September until, is it February, MPC had not met. So there was no monetary policy intervention. Uh, and of course, the Naira, the, the, the scarcity of dollars, uh, all the other things, the ways and means that had been created by the former CBN governor, all of those uh, you know, conspired uh, to make <laughs> the Naira fall precipitously, especially in the early parts of the year. Now, the change that has happened with the first 400 basis point increase uh, and then subsequently another 200 basis point uh, should do two things. One was it, it's supposed to also bring down inflation, which it hasn't. Uh, the second is that the, um, there should be investments because what happens is that when interest rates are increased generally, monetary policy-wise, what you do is that you are mopping up liquidity from the system. And if you reduce the supply of Naira in the system, then the Naira strengthens. The second thing that is happening is that there would be propensity to invest. Sorry, Interest just, rates are higher. Just, just one second. Yes. On the period, so when you, when you make the, you said when you make the flow of the naira less, you increase its strength. Yes. Wasn't that what the previous administration was trying to do? No, it wasn't. It wasn't. You see, it, it was not transparent in what they were doing. They were printing money and dishing it out to the government exceeding even the capacity to borrow. Pause. That's the ways and, ways and means. Pause. Pause. So those ways and means means that over 30 trillion naira was printed in the last administration I, I, I get that, I get that, that went into the system. I get that. And but that basically means that your currency is supposed to fall, and it hadn't. But the, the, the reason I'm asking is, yeah. they said that we had something in reg three trillion plus in circulation, and that was too, too much. So, they so, wanted to bring it down. So money in circulation is one thing. Okay. Money spent is another. See, so there are two things. The basic economics says that if you want to compare your currency to another country's currency, look at your inflation rates. I mean, this might be economics 101. So what do I mean by that? So if, let's say, we want to compare ourselves to the U.S., What's the inflation rate in the U.S.? What's the inflation rate in Nigeria? Let's, for the sake of this discussion, say the U.S. is 3%, Nigeria is 10%. I know it's not 10%. I'm just saying that, right? <laughs> so there is a differential of 7%. That means, assuming nothing else happens, every year our currency should devalue by 7% compared to the dollar. Okay. If, you, if it doesn't happen, it means that something is going on underneath Either we are being more productive than the U.S. in terms of productivity. Or the ways and means. Or yeah. something else is happening. And if something else is happening, it will come back and bite you later. And that's what happened in the previous eight years. Okay. Um, Mr. Dewey, are we expecting to see this trend continue? Oh, yes. Um, it's going to continue for sh a short while because um, the fundamentals that controls exchange rate we've not addressed properly. Now, 
if you look at a lot of people think we have more money that's why I mean dollar in reserve that's why Naira is uh, gaining but actually what has happened is that um, one major issue if you address in the country you solve 60 percent of your problem mm. and that is the corruption in that forex market so if you recall the CBN governor, and I give it to these guys uh, for what they've been able to do, forward contract on foreign exchange, that um, obligation that central bank need to redeem, they discover that over $2.4 billion has no backup. Yeah. And so that alone, $2.5 billion is the total money we need to even do the new recapitalization <laughs> of all banks in Nigeria, <laughs> which is about um, 5 trillion naira, because analysis says 4.7 to 5 trillion naira. So it means that if the CBN governor had been careless to pay 2.5 billion, maybe certain things will go under the carpet, he will take his own share, and then you discover that the central bank will have been the one paying people that would then come back to own the banks in Nigeria. Hmm. So, first thing wow. is the issue hmm. of eliminating corruption hmm. in that system. So, forward contract, you can bring a fake paper and get money from money. the CBN. The second thing is the body language of the governor of central bank is showing people that are involved in over invoicing and round tripping that look don't go near this guy you are going to be in soup because 2.4 billion dollars that he declined paying is an indication that he was not going to allow all of such so what has happened is that in the last seven days the foreign exchange market has become the buyer's market and I had an experience yesterday with a client who wanted to purchase $5,000 from a bureau de change. They offered him $1,200 to a dollar. I asked him to ask other people. Another BDC offered $1,148. And I assisted him to send message to those people that, sorry, we are not buying from you because your rate is too high. too high. Don't bother to pay to the account. You know what happened? 30 minutes later, this guy said, no, I'm going to pay. Uh, how much did you say you got it? Do 1,150. And I said, okay, this two naira is not a bad idea. Now, you purchase from this party and from that other party. What has happened is that those that are using it to trade and shortchanging the economy, over invoicing, you want to buy something that is $1 million, you are bringing invoice of $10 million. The central bank is now awake. I'm, I'm sure you are aware that 20 something human beings have been laid off and been removed from the central bank. 60, 60, 60 exactly. now. Uh, yeah. You know, 60. directors. And they were not asked to go because uh, there's something. So the guy is cleaning up that place. And so those that are checking the invoices and the commercial banks are also waking up. Not only that, there is a policy that was rolled out in the last one week that says collateralization of loan with foreign exchange account, cash in your bank account, we no longer be allowed. You can use euro bonds. And so your money must translate to real economic activity and investment. Mm. Not only that, the recapitalization of banks, the, the banks with um, uh, international authorization will now be 500 billion. 500 billion is like 500 million dollars. And guess what? Those that will invest, they've started the activity of bringing money into the country. Banks with national authorization is now 200 billion, as against the 25 billion before. So this money are now coming in, 
and then banks are offering to sell dollar at a rate that is reasonable. At a time, reasonable. the black market, the black market was below the CBN mm. rate mm. in the last 10 days. Yeah. And that tells you that the CBN now look at it and say, look, the break-even point should not occur between CBN rate and the parallel market. So they came down to 1,100. So in the next couple of days, you will see that the black market is going to come down to 1,000 naira. This morning, somebody has said, oh, 1,075. So wow. that is mm. policy statement and cleaning up mm. and blocking the loopholes. The only challenge we're going to have mm. is that we are not matching the monetary policy with fiscal policy. We are gaining in terms of Naira value. Now you are introducing increase in electricity tariff. That is going to be counterproductive you know, because of production we keep rising. Well, the, the, the minister did say that mm. um, if the Naira fell more, that the tariff would also drop. I pray so. Mm. You know, but you know, there's something, uh, you know, Mr. Kerry, there's something that, I mean, he just talked about the recapitalization of the Naira now. And of the banks. Of the of, banks. Of the banks. Yeah. It's, it's like too many things happening too soon, too yeah. quickly yeah. in the banking sector already. Uh, even though, as he said, you know, the bankers are doing what they know how to do best, gathering money and all of that. But at the same time, some banks are jittery. Shouldn't they be? Uh, jittery, why? Um, uh, so, it's, You're a what banker, has happened? So you can understand what, 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 the what, what has what has it, happened? They, they previously, yeah. my apologies. Yeah. Pre previously, when banks recapitalized, some went under, some Correct. merged, and Correct. all of those things. Correct. So they should be. Jittery. Yeah, I mean, there are fundamental things. I mean, my 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 friend here is um, an accountant. Technically speaking, with the recapitalization announcement, you could use retained earnings. The central bank clearly said. No you do way. not use retained earnings. So there are banks today that could have just recapitalized, you know, like within that. a few weeks yeah. if you want, because mm. they have sitting profits they had made over the years that they have not distributed to shareholders mm. and they have not bought shares with it or whatever. So it's sitting as retained earnings. That technically, accounting wise, could be used to recapitalize. But the central bank said no. And the reason they said no was that looking at the bank's books, the net open position had FX. And FX had some unrealized gains. Of course, by the end of the year, you have to book it as profit and it goes directly into your retained earnings. So they said, no, we want you to bring additional capital from your shareholders. Now, that would basically mean that there would be capital injection into banks, both the international and the national. The gaps are so huge. Now, that may bring in foreign investors or local investors. Either way, it's, it will strengthen the Naira. How? If it is local investor, then their Naira could go chase dollars, but it's now going into the banks as an investment. That means that there would be less Naira in circulation yeah. and more dollars in circulation. Therefore, the Naira would strengthen. Two, if they bring in FX, uh, I just saw one bank announcing $750 million rights issue. Um, that basically means that there would be FX flowing into the economy. Which that would need. also mean hmm. that there would be FX supply and therefore the Naira strengthens. The second thing which, you know, had happened in the last few weeks is that with the interest rate rise, there is also a lot of foreign portfolio investors that have come into the market. Most of them are coming in and buying instruments such as treasury bills. I mean, uh, the last I spoke with one of the investment banks uh, was that uh, treasury bills have gone up to 21, 22 percent one year treasury bills. Now, this is the same thing that beginning of this year was around 10 or sub 10 percent. Mm. That means that people would bring in money. And, and another thing that I haven't yet seen data on, but it would definitely show, 
is diaspora Nigerians are bring, will begin to bring in more dollars into the market. It said it used to be around 25 billion, went down to less than 20 billion in the last two years or so. And this year, we should be able to breach that 25 billion or above. That's just a component. And if you think about it, diaspora Nigerians' remittances is higher than oil receipts. Yes. And, and so it should be looked at as something that the monetary policy uh, 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 entity, the central bank, should look at it and pay more attention to it. Whether you create bonds, longer term bonds and things like that, which I know countries like Mexico and others have done in the past. All of those would further strengthen the Naira in which case the idea of saying the Naira technically could hit a thousand or even sub thousand Naira to the dollar is possible. But yeah. you also heard him say here now just a while ago that even though we are seeing activities in the monetary sector, monetary policies, but we still have a, a variance or disparity with fiscal policies. Correct. Now, 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 so, so is that an injurious uh, position? So, so there are two things. One is that even from the banking side, even on the monetary policy side, when you say, okay, bring in more capital, what would the banks do with that huge capital? Mm -hmm. The other thing we should also have in mind is that when the monetary policy committee sat and raised interest rates, they didn't just stop at interest rates. They also raised the CRR, which is the cash reserve ratio. Now, what that means is that as a bank, it used to be 32.5%, now it's 45%. For every 100 Naira deposited by a customer, 45 Naira would be taken by the central bank, and you don't get any interest as a bank. When I first came to this country 20 years ago, it was around 10% or 12%. Today it is 45%. That means that a portion of the capital that could be used to lend has been quarantined and it's not earning any interests. Now, that, after you've done that and then you now ask them to recapitalize, um, when they start releasing CRR, it will also have an effect on the liquidity position of the economy. So you have to balance things. Of course, the other culprit on the other side uh, is the fiscal side of the equation or exactly. the economy. And I know that the current central bank governor and the current minister of finance have had, had been colleagues uh, a few years ago, or a few decades, <laughs> few? Uh, some decades ago. <laughs> and, and that would make coordination much easier. You know, it's, it's easier to deal with somebody that you know yeah. and someone that you don't. Oh. And, uh, you know, it's, we, 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 we may be lucky there. And so there may be less fiscal recklessness, hopefully, um, and, and there won't be too much spending. Or if there is going to be spending, it should be quarantined. Uh, it should be targeted towards real infrastructure that will add macroeconomic we'll, value we'll, to we'll the we'll economy. Co we'll come back okay. to that one. But yeah. do you agree with okay. you? Okay. Yes, um, except that, um, you know, when the CRR was raised to 45%. What the central bank was trying to do is to actually control um, majorly insider lending among banks and saying, look, depositors have their money with you. The money must be saved. What I can say, if the central bank and the federal government can engage more in inter intervention lending using the CRR, because you have the funds of the bank with you. On the other hand, the central bank can become guarantor to borrowers in the real sector, especially the MSME. That's what can complement what is happening uh, you know, in the monetary policy, such that people have access to credit. Things like um, solar energy uh, support for MSME where government can say, look, all banks, even if you say you don't have money, from the cash reserve ratio, we are releasing 15% out of the 45, and we are using this specific lending to help energy 
uh, generation, such that with the banks that the, uh, is being created and tariffs changes, if you have alternative power supply, you have 5 kVA, 10 kVA, and you know that the solar panels, your inverter, the charge controller that is being given to you by the banks is something you can pay over five years. Then you have nothing to worry about. You can just tell PSD, uh, PSCN, please go to hell. I have my power supply. So there are certain intervention that need to come in. Now that people will not be able to afford electricity in some places, we need to look at that cash reserve ratio and say, can we take 15% chunk out of it and say, banks, you are lending to this specific uh, sector, and then the central bank can be a guarantor mm. to that. I, I think one thing about the CRR is that, you know, it's one of the things that the current central bank governor did to clean up the mess that he found out. And what I mean by that is that the former CBN governor had something called DCRR, discretionary cash reserve ratio. Mm. So, so at the time, you know, those, during those eight years or so, CRR was supposed to be 32.5%. But, but the effective CRR <laughs> has, for some banks, it had gone up to 60%. Mm. I know a bank that had even hit 100% meaning that every Naira deposited, the central bank governor had taken it away from the bank. And then that thing about intervention or lending of that DCRR, in fact, they first introduced what they call special bills, which would make the banks earn about 2 or 2.5% on those money above the regular CRR. Uh, that didn't solve the problem. And then they then came up with the idea of if you're going to loan, lend, you can take a portion of that CRR and lend. Still, on average, the CR, CRR was somewhere around 50% or higher. Now, the idea of bringing it to 45% and say, I will release some of those above 45%, but gradually... Uh, or in the instances of some that have not met that, they would then be quarantining, would basically be fair, transparent to all, rather than the word D, which was used, discretionary, which was used uh, by the former CBN government. There's some value in the issue you raised about mm -hmm. lending to uh, the real sector. So yes. Basically. Especially uh, micro, small and medium enterprises. That will inject some... Um, capital into their businesses Correct. and perhaps reduce some pressure that the number of people spend the spending power that people are having now. E correct. I think I think one of the fundamental things and that's the structural part of our economy that need to be addressed. Um, having financial inclusion and having access to finance by micro, small and medium enterprises is fundamental at affordable interest rates. Um, now the the pragmatic thing to do is to look at the entire system to say that let's solve the issue of security, let's help people go back to the farms and produce. Productivity is very important. Let's not have food wastes, because I saw somewhere recently that um, some of the homegrown foods are becoming more expensive than imported, similarly, similarly imported uh, foods. That is a very disastrous thing, if that is true. I mean, it was production. a spot survey that was done by one paper, I believe. But, but you know, so, so, so those need, fundamental issues need to be addressed. Um, I've seen people talk about price control. Let's not go, go there. It's unorthodox. Um, it can be disastrous. It would also bring in some other new agents who will come and take advantage of those situations. Um, however, the lending to micro, small, and medium enterprises, there are entities that have been established to do that, Development Bank of Nigeria, Bank of Industry, uh, Bank of Agri, et cetera, et cetera, the DFIs. The reason why the DFIs can do that is that they could actually lend 
in low double digit or single digit yeah. and which is uh, what the which is what industry. is needed to yes. uh, 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 catalyze the economy yeah. such that more productivity comes in and therefore affordability of prices of uh, products that come out of those factories will then go well for the economy long term. Okay, okay. Mr. Adeoye, um, how will this rebound affect import costs and inflation? Oh, definitely. Um, on the average, cost of production will begin to go down because there are essential materials that you have to buy, regardless of what dollar is in the country. At one five, you're still buying maybe one million liter of something chemical in your industry. Mm -hmm. Now, when CBN is now selling to you at 1,100, you are buying the same thing. So on the average, it means that uh, from 1,500, you are gaining about 400 Naira per unit of that item. So it's a good step in the right direction. Mm -hmm. um, but like I said, we need to look at what we call sensitivity analysis mm -hmm. in accounting that as much as you are gaining 400 in the cost of your importation, you have to look at other factors because you have three lines in the graph. One is cost of other things. The second one is the exchange rate, mm -hmm. where you now have the prices of your goods. Now, you will not, there is no way pricing they respond to monetary policy, like exchange rate, and we also respond to other costs, taking electricity costs, for example. So when Naira rebounds and it was coming to 1,100, you're getting at 1,075, now some people will sell at 1,000. It is expected that, on the average, cost of goods and services should go down significantly. Unfortunately, but when that graph yeah. wanted to go down, he saw electricity bill running after it. And so the graph doesn't, and you know, you don't want to wait. It's like a bullet coming to hit you. You just have to run. And that's why we may not experience too much immediate change in prices uh -huh. unless we address other costs. Mr. Ray, but you are aware that once a, a, a cost goes up in Nigeria, it is most likely not coming down, it, it, no matter it, what happens. It, it, it can come if we address both policies. I'll give you an example. I happened to be a distributor of vegetable oil at the time. We were selling for 6,500 a keg, and then suddenly it went to 8,000, 9,000 because of that sudden uh, increase in exchange rate and then supply gap in mm -hmm. kegs that mm -hmm. they use mm -hmm. during COVID. And then after COVID, mass production began in some places, the price went down. And we started selling at six five. Of course, we had employees who took advantage of customers. Of course. And they continued to sell to them mm. at the Ma same old price. Yes. Until one day we discovered a popular eatery in Nigeria claiming to have paid a given amount to his staff. And then we were wondering, how much did you pay? We saw that it was old price. So this issue of not coming down now borders on patriotism and then the system itself. It's all about corruption. Yeah. Right. It's all about corruption. So you see people who have nothing to do with dollar saying purple has gone up. Why? Because say, of dollar. Dollar. Yeah. So I see... <laughs> Because there are other things affecting that person also. When he sells that purple, he's going to get electricity, he's going to get diesel, he's going to get PMS. So he's using dollar as the excuse for his increase in price. So that's why it's a holistic decision you have to make. Mm -hmm. And you have to sit down and look at the graph. Sensitivity analysis, if we suddenly allow this to go up, what would be the effect mm. on other things? Interesting. Okay. So that we don't have a wrong Mr. break even point. Mr. Mr. Carey, you mentioned the income from diaspora people earlier. The remittance. Yes. Let's look at that closely. Um, some countries actually train staff 
for export yeah. and they make money out of it. Looking at the amount of money we get from these remittances from our brothers out there, is it a, a possibility that we can consider? Because there's so much money coming from there. You say that amount, the, the amount we get from it compares with the money we're making from crude oil. So it is something that we need to pay attention to. And can part of that paying attention be actually putting a system around it and making it formal? The government is supporting this with this and this and this because it is expecting X, Y, Z amount from it. E e um, e yes, and... Um one has to be cautiously optimistic when you want to put something like this in place. Mm -hmm. The mechanism for attracting remittances from Nigerians in diaspora is to make it convenient. And as rational human beings, they would want to put their money where they get the most return. So if it is uh, money that would not even cross our border, they would do so. By that I mean... Uh, you know, a friend living in the U.S. wants to send a thousand dollars to his family mm. for to purchase something, and you sitting in Nigeria need a thousand dollars to buy something, mm -hmm. and no border is crossed. Yes, but you the money doesn't actually arrive here. And so, uh, however, if the rate is such that you know we discussed earlier the difference between parallel market and the official rate. If it is within two, three percent, there is no incentive in taking any risks. I could send my money knowing that I'm getting the market rate. Mm -hmm. And therefore, rationality dictates that human beings as rational animals would then be able to use the to do the remittance. Now, with that then, it means that the central bank can begin to monitor these. And as more people move to Canada, more is coming from Canada versus the US or whatever, and more coming from New Zealand or Australia, whatever. Now, what happens is that there are some countries that long time ago, I mean, 20, 30 years ago, India was exporting its, um, its talent. Educational system remained great in India. Just like in the 60s in Nigeria, the educational system was sound. Some of us went through public, free public education that was sound. And when you go to the US or you go abroad for graduate studies, you've covered many of these things in your undergraduate days. And therefore, you become extremely competitive. And so are you in the industry. Now, that can be a strategy. You know, the discussion about AI, this discussion about um, the information communication technology, all of those would add to the skilled manpower such that these days they don't even have to pack their back and live abroad. They could be here in Nigeria and be working for people abroad. And be earning and dollars. Earning dollars. And all of those need to be made so easy for them to earn that, and, and it will add to the economy. Okay, yeah, let, let, just one simplistic. Okay. Beyond the um, convenient remittance um, system in place, in economics there is what we call invisible hand theory, mm. which motivates you to channel your investment to a given geographical location or refuse to. So if we want Nigerians in diaspora to remit more money into the country, we need to look at our ease of doing business in the country. Take, for example, you are in the U.S. You want to send money to build malls, to set up farms, to do something. In three days, you've received 10, 20 regulatory agencies. NAVDA, SOS, this one, base, the Wole Wole, or whatever you call them. So, are, you, are those the invisible hands? The, the, yes, the, <laughs> those are not no, invisible. No, no, you no. can see them. As, <laughs> as, as far as when we say invisible hand theory, something that other people may not see as your reason for not going somewhere, oh. yeah, but yeah. you have something blocking you from going there. Okay. So you feel like, okay, recently I read. I'm sure you must have read 
that somebody imported a Lexus uh, into Ghana, and there are 23, <laughs> 21 different uh, charges. You know, somebody in government said, no, we can't continue like this. So if you want people to bring their money into your country, ease of doing business, I don't get to the airport and somebody is messing me up. Look, the way we run our taxi system at the local airport, I'm still looking for opportunity to meet Kiyama. This is total nonsense. You come in, 10, 15 people will say, taxi here, it has AC, daddy, where are you going? Even as you are walking into your car in the car park, that is a very bad system. Psychologically, it can discourage you from bringing your investment. So you need to address this. Land titles is very key. You're buying property, you're not getting CFO, you get, you're looking for approval, you're not getting it. You need maybe NAFDAQ number, whatever. So, these are issues okay. because people will invest when there is ease just, just, of just, We have just about a minute or so to go, but I, I feel the need for us to raise this, even if it's just for one, one minute each. The challenge of communicating these ideals that we have discussed from government to the people. I mean, you are not government officials. You have given postulations and a number of people can reason with you, but convincing people that these things are needful now, it's a significant challenge, isn't it? You mean, which people are you talking from to? From government, you are talking about to government. the people. Government. Why yes. are you using adjective to qualify government as people? Convincing government. <laughs> that's what no, 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 no. Government convincing the people that these things are needful for now. Because what are the things that are needful for All them? these issues, I mean, I mean expensive mean, times. The, the whatever, whatever it, policy. The president, the president what, called yes. it, yes. Co the president called it, is very key. Exactly, Important. the president called it baby steps of pain. Correct. They aren't baby steps, they are like I, big punches. I want to suggest, for the next six months, um, my brother, the Minister of Finance, we are from the same company, he's an Iruwa man in Abel Kuta. he's my brother, <laughs> my elder brother. Um, he's doing very well. And the guy in Central Bank, they are doing very well. One more thing they need to do, the two of them should have, uh, with the Minister of um, Trade and Investment, the three of them need to have regular conversation with us in the country. If possible, monthly press briefing. Just take maybe 10 issues, monetary policy, fiscal policy, this is what we are doing. This will be the effect. Expect this graph to happen at so 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 time. Mm. Now, communication helps people to trust you. Thank you. If you don't talk to us, we cannot trust you. Yes, sir. I indeed, I think that is that is the suggestion I would make. Is that communication? Um, you know, I, I had a manager a long time ago who told me that the quality of your communication equates to the quality of your life. Um, as a nation, the quality of communication need to improve, the frequency need to improve. Quality means that you actually look at the policy and the implications of the policy, both, both positive and negative. You don't just come and talk about the positives and then the press now comes up with the negatives and the whole, the credibility of the government falls. Okay. Now, what, what we need to have is more comprehensive, more frequent, high-quality communication to the citizens. Well, uh, perhaps, um, uh, I don't know, well, FECOMNET on X says, has the rebound affected prices of fuel and diesel? Well, don't answer that Well, one. we are expecting the price of diesel to go down. It yeah. started going down. Has uh, yeah. the See, rebound affected? It has, rebound it has started Naira. coming down. I think um, something oh, that I saw said it from 1,600 per liter to, 1, to around 1,200 or 1,250 or something like that. That was okay. what something that uh, Mr. I saw. Some I, I saw Dangote. two items. One was, was the Dangote, and there was something on oh, okay. either Naira metrics or one of those. Okay. Yes, for well, um, the import I, I think Olani Waju also agrees with you, Mr. D. He says price is not coming down. Borders on patriotism and the failure of the system. Uh -huh. I beg government get work to do. <laughs> we agree. <laughs> they asked for the job. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Mr. <laughs> Lubenga Deoye, a lawyer and a chartered accountant, as well as uh, Mr. Buka Kiari, um, chairman, former <laughs> chairman of uh, the NESG and co-founder of Trans Sahara Investment Corporation.
Thank you very much. Thank you. Pleasure to be for here. For shedding more light on this Naira rebound to us. And, um, well... Giving us hope. <laughs> That's the word. And we will we also return. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, gentlemen. Sunrise will return in just a moment with yet another interesting conversation. Make sure you're part of it. We must stand for Nigeria. Talking about soil values launch in a moment, but uh, I have a little comment here regarding something that we spoke about at the beginning of the program. Ugo Chuku Iwu says, Unano de Taya. <laughs> How many identification are we going to have in this country? Anyways, it's just another means to loot. Ah. Una well don't know. <laughs> <Awa wandeo. laughs> Me neither. <laughs> <laughs> okay, now let's talk about soil values launch. What does that mean? Over the past um, five decades, the International Fertilizer Development Center has, has been a pioneer in promoting innovative and sustainable um, agricultural technologies um, that have transformed the lives of millions of people around the world. Since 1974, the organization never stayed straight from its core mission of improving the livelihoods of small-scale farmers and agro-entrepreneurs in order to catalyze positive global change through the transformative potential of agriculture. Of course, over the years, IFDC, that's International Fertilizer Development Center, has implemented these technologies um, 
globally, helping more than 100 countries boost their agricultural productivity through training and development programs. Let's have this conversation this morning with Dr. Bijokazo Fofana, who is Program Director, Soil Values. Thank you for joining us this morning. They are both in our Abuja studio, along with Yusuf Dramani, Office Director, Nigeria. Gentlemen, thank you for being here. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right. Let's begin with you, Dr. Fofana. For those who are wondering what all of these means, please talk, about, talk to us about the Soil Values launch. Uh, thank you very much for giving me the opportunity. Yes, soil value launch. The question is, what's the value of our soils? Of course, uh, it looks like the soils have no value, actually. But, uh, you know, we are using soils as medium to produce food, right? And when you have a handful of soil, it's not a commodity that you can sell. So which is the opposite of your, if when you have a handful of maize, that has a kind of monetary value. So along the way, we have been neglecting the functions of our soils as source of our food, okay? And then we have also something that we call spatial gap, you know? When you pollute your soil on point E, and then you are also polluting the groundwater on point B. So nobody cares about the continuity of, of the groundwater by polluting point E. And we ignore that when you pollute by using too much fertilizer on point E, you are also polluting point B. So along the way, soils have been neglected. And that is why the soil value is now trying to catalyze a transformation, okay? Aiming at, you know, enticing, I would say, a systemic change towards really improving uh, the soil health in a more sustainable way, and then make sure that the soil value, the soils will provide food that is needed for our food security. So the soil value launch aimed to increase the awareness, first of all, of our 10 years programs, but at the same time, it aims at bringing all bilateral and, and, and strategic donor communities, you know, to work on a coherent, effective, and efficient way of implementing the program. But in addition to that, we want to make sure that we bring all the community, donor communities together for leveraging towards you know, increasing additional funds, not only to support the implementation of the program within the Sahelian countries, but also to take the program at a larger scale beyond the Sahelian countries and even in Africa. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Dramani. Um, let us zero down to Nigeria. Um, where is your catchment area in Nigeria? What farmers, small um, holding farmers specifically, are you dealing with in Nigeria? Thank you very much. Uh, let me use this opportunity to uh, thank your, your, your viewers, your cherished viewers. Um, for us in RBC, I can maybe give you a broad, a small, a little history about IVC, then zoom to Nigeria. So IVC is actually established in the United States and Mosul, Alabama in uh, 1974, and then uh, became a public international organization signed by the then government of, of US, uh, president of US, Jimmy Carter. And so in US, we enjoyed the immunities, the privileges, and exemptions under the International Organization uh, Public Act. So in Nigeria, FDC was actually um, became operational in Nigeria in 2003. And in 2003, we supported the government of Nigeria in implementing the voucher program 
and implementing a number of programs and projects um, across the Nigeria. So I can, to answer your question, I can say that ABDC has implemented programs and projects across almost all the states in, 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 in Nigeria. Um, talking about the northern, the northern part, talking about the southern, southeast, all part, we've implemented a number of projects. So currently, as we speak, we have um, about three offices in Nigeria. We have the head office, which is in Abuja. I mean, in Nigeria, our main office is in Abuja. And also we have um, another office in Kano, and then also another office in, in Ibadan. Uh, thank you very much. Mm. Interesting. Uh, perhaps it, it'll also be good because so many people would want to know if we've been in this in the country for so long and been doing so much, perhaps access might be an issue. What's been the feedback you've gotten from your beneficiaries over the years? Yes, yeah, so for, for us in IBDC, we especially started um, uh, our presence, our presence in Nigeria at a time when uh, input system, agricultural input system in Nigeria was really not developed and access to input um, is, was a major problem. So, um, and you know, for us in IBDC, we stand for uh, three major things. One, you know, we, have both, we are both research and development organization. And under that, we stand for three things. Develop better technologies, um, catalyze productivity, and also strengthen market. So as a result of that, we've been able to work with private sector, with farmers, um, and with the government of Nigeria, especially the Ministry of Agriculture, support them in coming up with technologies that will help, um, help farmers to improve their productivity, uh, and also uh, try to get what we call um, better market for them. And working with the private sector, challenges faced by private sector is the quality of, of raw materials that they, they require to feed their factory, and that's the engine to pick their factory and, and, and to produce quality products for the citizenry uh, has been a challenge. So we've worked with a number of um, private sector, private sectors and, and all that, and farmers, and try to improve their uh, capabilities in, in meeting the, the market demand. And, and we've done that quite, quite well. Um, the recent... Uh, a report evaluation that was conducted um, with the farmers uh, indicate that uh, ABDC has been so instrumental. But of course, uh, nothing goes easy. You, you definitely will not be able to meet um, all your required expectations. But of course, the fact remains that ABDC has been the, the household name um, as far as uh, uh, areas where we work with and as far as the government institutions that we work with and the private sector we work with. Mm. Thank you. Okay. Well, Dr. Fofana, you know, as uh, Mr. Dramani has said, there isn't a, any situation that will not come with its own challenges. The natural question some other people may want to ask you right now is, I mean, when we talk about agriculture, farming, herding, and all of that in Nigeria, one of the first issues a good number of people think about is security or a lack of it. Has that been, how significant has that been in your work in Nigeria? Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I think security, of course, has been and is still an issue, um, uh, part of issues in our intervention strategy. So what we have been doing is that we have set up uh, institutionally what we call adaptive management, okay? Uh, which consists mainly of, you know, capacitating the national expertise in promoting um, climate smart, seed saving, water saving, and fertilizer savings technologies. So by capacitating, by capacitating the local um, partners so we were able actually to delegate our interventions in involving the local communities in implementing our technologies, okay? So in applying this adaptive management, we were able, even 
if we are not able to be in the locality, in the far remote communities in person, so we were able to capacitate the local communities, you know, to implement the technologies on our behalf. But that is one component. The second component is we, we also try to develop platforms, knowledge transfer and development platforms, not only for research, but also for extension uh, at community level so that, you know, we create a conducive environment for interactions, dialogue among the local communities for knowledge transfer using also ITs, because we are now, the internet is, 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 is there. So we are trying to use the new generation uh, IT technologies uh, to train farmers on remote and make sure that they will be able to implement the technologies on our behalf, even without our physical presence mm. in the communities. So that is why, what, how we are operating, as I'm talking now, and we are even trying also to develop modules that we are implementing on remotely to make sure that, you know, we communicate effectively as, you know, the communication is key. Uh, even it could, it can also affect our performance. So we are also putting a very strong emphasis on the quality of our communication, on communication and then also improving the quality of you know, the message, actually, we want to convey to the communities to make sure that, we, you know, we don't bias the content of the communication and then transfer the knowledge towards improving the performance of our technologies mm. in collaboration with the local communities. Yeah, staying with you, Dr. Fafana, you mentioned the use of IT. Um, I, I want to imagine that uh, most uh, small-scale farmers in Nigeria are illiterate. So how well are you succeeding with the introduction of IT to their businesses? Okay, thank you very much. Uh, our, strategic our strategic entry points are actually um, cooperatives. We don't work with individual farmers, ah, but we okay. work with cooperatives as rural institutions. And then when you have cooperatives, it means you have different bodies, right, within the cooperatives. And most of them are, of course, most of the members of cooperatives are illiterate, but there are those who are already literate. And we are using these high educated elements of the cooperative to transfer the knowledge. And there are those who are strictly down the knowledge to the local members who are not very well educated. So the use of IT is, 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 is really directed to those people who can read and who can really digest the IT communication. And they are those who are going to cascade down, actually, the IT knowledge to the illiterate members of the cooperatives. Interesting. You know, uh, le let me come back to the, Mr. Dramani on this one. I wanted to ask uh, Dr. Fofana, but I can ask you, uh, Mr. Dramani, as well. It's about soil values. And one of the things that I've seen in the work that you're doing is about the fertility of the soil. What, what, uh, maybe, maybe some feedback. What have you seen about the soil in the various parts of Nigeria that you have worked in terms of its fertility? I know you are, you are all about fertilizer and, and the rest of that, but tell us what you have found about the fertility of Nigerian soil in the various communities where your cooperatives operate. Okay, thank you very much. Um, before I answer my, the question, maybe I should also add something uh, to what Fafana um, earlier said um, regarding security issues. Um, 
One thing we understand over the years working in Nigeria and, and other parts of the world, not only in Nigeria, because RBC is present in a lot of countries. Um, so we draw experiences from all these countries that uh, we operate in. Is, is that the, 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 they say the devil finds uh, work for the idle hand. And so the point is that uh, sometimes is employment, and that is what we've been working through all the projects and programs we implement, creating jobs, sustainable jobs for the youth, um, making the youth busy, and concentrating on women as well, and because uh, if you educate a woman, you educate a nation, and therefore um, making the women um, more productive and, and income secured means that their children will also get better education, better training, and get better directions. And this is the way we can go to ensure that we have uh, maximum security um, in, 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 in our, in the, in our uh, part of the world. And FDC have been working um, tirelessly with this. Um, also, <clears throat> in terms of foreign sand, uh, even in Nigeria, when we work with uh, dairy and livestock farmers and crop producers, uh, sometimes you see agitation because of uh, clashes here and there. And so the the, what we've been working all along is to try and make sure that uh, there's understanding, because the point is if there's understanding and in whatever the, with the people you are working with, uh, clearly you're going to have a peaceful environment to work with. And, and therefore, we've worked extensively with the government institutions, through the ADPs, and, and through the ministries to ensure that at least there's a clear understanding and, and, and coexistence between the livestock farmers and the crop producers or and that in, in, the, in our catchment area. Um, so, so for us, that is fine. In terms of ICT, we know that if people can read, they can see. And so we develop videos that uh, help farmers um, to those who are illiterate to also understand, know the practical part of what we're trying to, 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 to teach. And, and that has worked well, especially when we implemented when, when we implemented the trimming program, uh, the government of Nigeria through the Ministry of uh, Water Resources implemented the trimming program that is transforming irrigation management in Nigeria. And RBC is uh, a consultant to the, to the ministry by supporting the extension, the ADPs in rolling out innovative technology to improve productivity of farmers around the irrigation schemes across the northern Nigeria. Okay. And uh, one of the key technologies we, we deployed is introducing uh, what we call the farmer field business schools, where we know majority of the farmers are illiterate, and the only way they can actually understand, adopt, and increase their productivity is uh, when they really see the good part of what you are trying to uh, um, um, teach them uh, okay. to, to, to roll out. Yeah. And so through the farmer field business schools, farmers have been put into clusters and technology ICT and others have been deployed to increase their understanding and adoption. So that to us has worked very well. So, and also to say that RDC is actually not just a fertilizer organization. I think sometimes uh, there's that uh, impression that because our name is International Fertilizer Organization, then it means that we are a fertilizer organization. Yes, of course, we 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 have a lot of <coughs> um, we, we have a lot of. Uh, uh, what called knowledge uh, in fertilizer sector, mm. and that is why during the onset in Nigeria, <coughs> we at RDC help in developing in um, in establishing uh, uh, Fepstan. Uh, Fepstan <coughs> is a fertilizer producer and uh, supplier association of Nigeria. Mm. Uh, RDC played instrumental role in, in 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 the formation of Fepstan and even in the formation of WAFA, that is West African Fertilizer Association. RDC is uh, the lead um, um, trying, uh, organization that actually uh, supported in establishment of this organization. Okay, Mr. So, Dramani. So, so, so Mr. for Dramani, us, yes, when it comes to fertilizer, Mr. Dramani, I beg your pardon. Yeah. I beg your pardon. We're fast running uh, out of time. You need to tell us about the launch before we go. Yeah. Okay. The launch. So uh, for the launch, I will, I, will, I will allow my brother here to to talk about it, and then. Uh, okay. I'll, 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 Dr. Fofana. Yeah. Yes. 
Uh, just let, let me address the, the, the issue of the soil fertility in our intervention zones. I think this is very, very critical. Dr. Fafana, we don't you know, with the have effect of time. The global warming, yeah, with the effect of the global warming, the, the soil organic carbon is, is really depleting, which also affects the, the fertility of our soil as such. Mm -hmm. So IFDC being an international organization in improving soil fertility, we are really promoting the integrated soil fertility management. Well, right? Mr. Fofana, perhaps we, we have to... My, my sincere apologies if you can hear me. We really have to go. Okay. Now, I was thinking that you... Maybe there was an event okay. that was going to be a launch, and we just wanted you to tell us yes, about that yes. in 10 seconds. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay, okay, very good. So the launch will, will, will take place in, in Fraser Suite, uh, and it's going to be implemented during the three days. The first day is going to be devoted to the technical workshop, and the second day is going to be the the key. What date? Uh, what, 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 what are the where dates? Where we'll be having, Fofana. Um, high, what, what are the dates? Yes. From what day to what day will it happen? Uh, from April 15 to 17. Okay. Okay. All right. All right, well, and then is the there a website, day, my apologies, just a second, is there a website that people can go to to get more information? Yeah, so, so for us in IFDC, we have, a, a, we have our website, okay. but, then, but then this is a consortium program, and so uh, we've not actually published uh, the launch. Okay. But, but then the case is that uh, as far as this launch is concerned, it's a high-level um, launch, where we are inviting the Honorable Vice President, uh, Kasim Ch uh, Shitima. We are also inviting the Honorable Minister of Agriculture. Okay, um, well, I, I'm hoping, or, uh, uh, Mr. Mr. Dramani, and, uh, just one second, and, my apologies, because we are completely out of time. I'm hoping that we'll be able to get some yeah. information out for people, maybe on social media platforms, so that they can be able to know more yeah. about Soil Values Law in Now yeah. We have to thank you very much for your time yes, this morning. Just, Mr. Yusuf Dramani, sincerely, just, we are completely out of time, just gentlemen. Add, my apologies. We are totally out of time. Yusuf Dramani is Office Director, Nigeria, and Dr. Bijokazo Fofana is Program Director, Soil Values. Thank you, gentlemen, for your time this morning. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right. Well, we're back right after now to take on another issue of importance. Do stay with us. Thanks for calling Bastion HMO. Thank you. Now that was my health insurance partner. Yeah, I was just as skeptical as you were about health insurance until I tried Bastion HMO. I got a health care plan that's right for me and my family. I have access to top quality health care services and facilities. We also get access to over 1,700 hospitals and clinics. Call 0800 Bastion, Bastion Health, the HMO that puts you in control. This is where you use do X to get Y. 
Unique to InDrive is the revolutionary feature that allows passengers and drivers to agree on a fair, fair price. Fair as in, okay, it's fair to you and me, and we're talking about the fare that you are going to pay. In the world of ride uh, hailing, only InDrive has taken such a stride towards passenger and driver empowerment. It redefines the, dyna that the dynamics of the ride hailing industry, establishing the most transparent relationship between driver and passenger. The simple act of opening the InDrive app opens up a world of options to you. You receive a price, yet you have the freedom to suggest what you can afford and negotiate this with the willing drivers. Uh, the senior business development representative of InDrive is with us and he's joining us uh, via Zoom and he is Timothy Oladimeji. Good morning, Mr. Oladimeji. Good morning. Thank you for joining us. Thank yeah. you for having me. Yes, this promo has a very interesting name indeed. Do X get Y? <laughs> 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 yes, it is, it is an interesting one. <laughs> yes. So tell us more about InDrive. How, since the inception of InDrive, how has this haggling been going on between your drivers and their passengers? Any challenges? Uh, well, I mean, Definitely, there are challenges, but I would like to focus more on the difference that's brought to the ride hailing sector. And case in point, um, a time where the operational cost for um, ride hailing went up when subsidy was removed about last year. Uh, it marked an important point to substantiate the solution that we bring um, to the ride hailing sector. Now, drivers, um, full cost is a major operational cost for um, our drivers. And um, when it went up, they had to look for ways to either make more or save more. And that is where our model of allowing drivers choose what works for them or bidding higher um, comes in to help them um, make um, meaningful gain from their ventures, even though operational costs have gone up. Another um, sector of our product which um, substantiated um, the revolution we brought to the ride hailing sector in Nigeria is the fact that we give the drivers opportunities to actually save more um, by the cost of our commission. For example, in Lagos, uh, we charge um, the lowest commission in the market at 9.99% um, net um, commission. Um, this gives the driver um, opportunity to also save more because, I mean, the commission is also an operational cost that he needs to think about as it is. Um, um, the fuel is going to consume um, depreciation of his vehicle uh, that he has to save for and so on and so forth. The commission he pays is also very low. So um, the negotiating part which allows the driver to be able to say, oh, no, this trip isn't very good for me. I don't think I want to go on this. I'll decline and save my fuel and save myself the stress. Or oh, this trip is better, I would go for it, or I would choose to bid higher for this trip and then make um, a better gain from it. You know, these things um, are part of the challenges that our solution has been able to um, solve for drivers in the ride hailing sector in Nigeria. Yes. Now, talk to us about the launch of this um, promo, this Do X, Get Y promo. Great. Um, uh, aside um, a means of rewarding and motivating our drivers, um, we realize that we should support uh, newer drivers. So we usually make a recommendation for new drivers, which is that try us for 7 to 14 days and make a well-informed decision about the gains, uh, about your revenue from our application. All right? So um, to also motivate and support new drivers who are joining, we launched the DoX KY promo which basically gives them the opportunity to complete 25 or more trips within um, 14 days, that's two weeks, and they stand the chance to get 10,000 euro worth of fuel voucher. Now, now um, that doesn't only allow them confirm 
um, the validity of what, we, of what we say at our platform has been one of the most profitable platforms for drivers to work, but also gives them the opportunity to, you know, um, get an incentive, which is the full voucher. So it's as simple as you're a new driver or you're coming on, you've, you've not been on our platform before, join our platform, test our plat application for the next 7 to 14 days and be able to complete more than 25 trips and you stand a chance to win uh, a 10,000 uh, naira full voucher. Uh, okay, that's um, in a in a space of one week, right? Two weeks, two weeks, fourteen oh. days. Our model, our recommendation is usually that for for you to be able to confirm that oh, I'm um, in drive is as profitable as we say it is. We usually recommend that drivers stay and work with us for a minimum of seven to fourteen days. So that is why we are giving the promo for fourteen days for them to be able to you know do this and also get rewarded for at least trying. Mm. So how do drivers qualify for these for this incentive? All right. Uh, it's as simple as if you're a new driver, the, first off, uh, the incentive is open to new drivers only. So oh. you just need to sign up, um, download the application on Google Play Store or iOS Play Store in Drive. And once you sign up and you are approved, um, after submitting the necessary document and you're going through a thorough verification process, um, then you have 14 days from the day of registration and approval to complete 25 or more trips to stand a chance. So it's as simple as register, be verified by a verification team after submitting all the necessary documents and complete 25 or more trips to qualify. What kinds of cars are allowed? What kind are not? Okay, um, the cars, first of a uh, four-door car, you have to have your AC working, your radio working, no cosmetic damages, and you uh, uh, cars ranging from 2004 downwards up to, I mean, recent model cars. So no cosmetic damage, working properly, having all the proper documents. Obviously, before you can get on our platform, the documents will be checked. If you don't have your proper documents, you can't get on our platform. But I'm gonna make. Yes, those are the kind of effects. Uh, let me. This might be a little comical. So you are discriminating against vintage cars. <laughs> no, don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> but how long will this campaign run for? So it's it started. Uh, we started the campaign on the 25th of March, and um, it's going to run through to the 25th of May. Huh. So if you're a new driver, you still have a chance about six weeks more to get on this and enjoy. Um, the benefits from the campaign. You know, we, we sometimes we like last minutes. So some some people might say, okay, you know what, I'm not really sure about this until it's almost over. So perhaps that might now tempt you to extend. Any chance? The likelihood of extending is very low because there is a cap to how many drivers we're rewarding. We're rewarding um, well over 1,000, well, about 1,200 drivers. So, I mean, if it get exhausted, sorry. I mean, to the drivers who miss out and wait to the last minute, as you said. But it's actually highly recommended. Um, looking, at our, um, looking at the exposure of our platform and adoption by users and also drivers, for example, we're expanding. Presently, I'm in Port Harcourt, um, That's because we have our tentacles in Port Harcourt, Owerri, and the like. So the, the speed at which we're expanding and growing is very high. So it's not an advisable thing to wait to the last minute. Okay. Hmm. Now, um, how can a driver qualify to be an in-drive driver? Go to the App Store or the Play Store, um, App Store for iOS and Play Store for Google um, Android users, type in in-drive, download in-drive, and then sign up as a driver. The same application works as the passenger and as a driver. So once you sign up, you go through a um, user-friendly um, signing up process. Very easy. I met a driver yesterday in Oweri, and he told me two days ago he had just signed up, and um, you had to wait for a couple of days to get verified. It's as simple as that. It's something that um, you can do just by yourself from the comfort of your home. Yeah. So it's so that I mean, simple. That, what, I, what I mean is that what qualifies me? I mean, I mean, if I have, uh, for instance, if I have some deformity or something, 
I will know that I can't be an in-drive in driver, so there's no point me going to the app for anything. I mean, what do I need to be, or how many, how many years of driving experience do I need to have to be an in-drive driver is what I What do I require to join up? Uh, for, uh, first off, um, for you to even have a car, you definitely would have gone through starting checks by the, um, by the authorities, for example, mm -hmm. have your vehicle checked at the VIO office, um, gotten your papers, gotten your license, which requires some rigorous process to get your license. Mm -hmm. And now these uh, processes already verify you as a driver. And uh, which is something I'm going to address um, quickly is about ride hailing. Ride hailing is a sector of the economy which basically gives people opportunity to earn extra. So the primary requirement to be a driver is already met by having your vehicle, your papers, and going through the right process of actually being able to put the vehicle on the road. Okay. So once you're able to do that, and you come on our platform, we verify these claims as well through our thorough verification process, and then you're good to go. We have training modules while you're being onboarded to show you the ropes and um, help you through your first few days um, as to how to bid, how to um, interact with your passengers, how to offer the service, and how to make the best of the platform as well. So aside taking the training or, or um, getting your papers from the necessary authorities, on our platform as well, we have um, user education modules that would help you be onboarded properly. If I have only one year driving experience, do I qualify? Yes, you do. Mm. Okay. Interesting. Um, just, to, I don't know, just a quick one. And I hope you know it, the answer to the question. Your website is indrive.com, is that correct? Yes, it is. Okay. I just wanted to be sure that you know it. And um, so where, if anyone right now is watching, that that's your website. So anyone watching right now, where can yeah. they go to get this information? This is what they do? Uh, okay. Which information are you referring to? Is it a promo? No, no. I mean, generally. I mean, you will get on the system and all oh, of okay. those things. I mean, we have our social... Social, social, net, um, social media platform, first okay. on Instagram at indrive.ng, uh, because we have indrive in over 700 cities in 46 countries are, across the world. Mm. In Nigeria, we operate in over um, about 10, 10 cities at the moment. So for Nigeria, on Instagram, we are at indrive.ng, and that leads you to a lot of um, links where you can get more information about mm. things that we're doing, our campaigns, our initiatives, and so on and so forth. You can also get a link to download load as well on um, indrive.ng on Instagram, as well as on Facebook. We had just recently launched our TikTok for our, our, our Gen Z and millennial users as well, because we are very big on understanding where our users are and reaching them with necessary information also. So um, also, our office is available in um, Victoria Island, Lagos. Um, that's 4C Idowu Martins, if you need to walk in as a passenger or as a driver. 4C Idowu Martins is at the second floor of the building. And we also have our office in Abuja as well, number three, at Barra um, Street um, in Wuse. So, yes, these are the channels for you to reach out to us. Mm -hmm. You can also reach us on the platform, on the, on the app itself. There's a support um, access from the um, application. Once you've downloaded the app, you can always reach support via the application. Okay. Um, before you go, how has InDrive invested in the welfare of its drivers? Beautiful. Um, I would usually like to use case scenarios um, to share these um, success stories, as I like to call them. Um, first off, our model um, is built on turning intangibles like fairness, transparency um, into tangibles. And um, the welfare um, for drivers is about making them feel um, respected and being treated fairly. And that is why we will not compel a driver to go on a trip that he doesn't find profitable. And that is why we give the driver the choice to either accept the trip, bid higher, or skip the trip. 
Now, if the driver is happy about the trip, that means that he's able to deliver excellent service to the passenger, and this creates a cycle of excellence community, which is what our platform is built on. All right, aside that um, concept of, you know, turning intangibles like fairness into tangibles, um, which our product has done, um, our commission as well is a way in which we think about drivers' welfare. You know, 9.9% um, commission being the lowest in the market is actually something laudable um, because it gives the driver the opportunity to be able to save more and, um, you know, pursue further goals. I mean, we've had um, sessions because we had a roundtable session, which is also another way we, you know, think about driver's welfare because you just don't think about it from what we think. We want to hear them. And listening is one of the first, uh, first parts of, you know, um, solving problems. So we had a, um, a roundtable session hosting stakeholders and mostly drivers, even the union members, um, in January to start the year. And we got to discuss and understand pain points, um, opportunities for improvement, and discuss our plans with them. Um, aside that, we also had to reward some of our best performing drivers with phones. And we also have more and more. And before um, this, pro um, this program, which is the DoX KY, um, across our network of cities in Abuja, Benin, Oweri, Port Harcourt, and Ibadan, as well as Lagos, we have been having promotions of rewarding drivers with 12 vouchers, as high as 15,000 air 12 vouchers, and so on and so forth. So um, these and many more, as, I mean, as the year goes on, we are rolling a whole lot um, to motivate and um, take care of the welfare for our drivers. Well, I'm sure those listening are glad that they joined in drive. All we can do now is just wish you all the best with your do X, get Y promo. Your Pythagoras theorem. Thank you very much, <laughs> Mr. Timothy Oladimiji. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. Right. So um, well, we'll be right back now with mm. the home stretch. Mm. And it's a different one today. This life is so sweet and so simple. Right from the day that I was born, making money, suffering violence, calling the violent, take it by force. It's in the world. In my passion, roll and banet, ya wanya, makonye wanyo, pateko. Just a hustle and they pray. Amen. One day he must pay. Amen. Our God do not they sleep. Amen. He must answer our prayers. Amen. Wait till you go chop, you go find. Amen. Wait till you go chop, you go no go see. Amen. I am a guy in the chigasu. Amen. 
you know, I remember a song that I, I don't know about you, but I sang when I was in primary school. Now that day is over, night is drawing near. Shadows of the evening still above the sky. Now fasting is <laughs> over. <laughs> so, now that fasting is over, you both, say, both fastings, okay. fastings, fastings are over. Mm -hmm. You know, many fasted for the last uh, in the past few weeks uh, during Lent and Ramadan, both uh, for religious holidays. Some others, as part of their own specific diet routine, it's not about those ones that that are which I need to do. After we have been told that when you fast. Your body eats up what is stored. And somebody sent me a post. You are looking fat. Okay, well, this episode is for you. <laughs> <laughs> so now, it has also been, uh, you know, made clear that fasting should not stop you from training altogether. And anytime fitness... Um, and at any time, fitness. However, it's really important to be mindful of that transition phase, right? During your first week of recovery from long fastings, such as this that we have had. And it is advised to take things step by step before commencing your usual training. That step by step is what we are talking about this morning, post-fasting workout regimen. And we have Joel Uzamere again with us this morning. He is CEO Institute of Registered Exercise Professionals, IREP. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you for having me, as usual. Is it a concern, this post-fasting thing? Y yes, it is um, very important that as we end the fasting, uh, for those who have lived an active lifestyle, uh, that they gradually go back into uh, their exercise routine. Um, the way the body works or the way God has created the body, if you just jump into any high intensity exercise or any high impact exercise, it will have a negative effect on you. And mm. it becomes a major demotivator for you to actually continue or progress in your, your fitness. So, and that's the thing with fitness. You, you might want to jump into something or just anything. You want to jump into that. And if you don't do it properly, you don't get injured, mm. okay? Or you're discouraged from um, the fact that your body can't take it. Some people start to feel dizzy and then uh, they, they stop. Whereas there is a dosage. There is how to gradually actually Ease go back, back in. yes, into that uh, routine. So just to be clear, something that you said so, at the beginning. So, sorry, sorry, okay. just before I forget this. Joel, I know some people who don't say because they're fasting, they're not going to continue their exercise regime. Yeah. I played tennis for years and Great. years. Yeah. And I, have, I had friends who, although they were fasting, either during Lent or during Ramadan, still played their tennis three, four times a week. Yeah. Well, it, it depends, first of all, on what they are doing during those. Maybe if, if, if you're fasting properly, you're actually staying away from food or certain kinds of food. Mm -hmm. So if what they do is maybe they eat till pretty early in the morning, depending on what they are doing, maybe they are eating at 5 a.m. or something, mm -hmm. they have stored up glycogen. Yeah, they have enough energy for a workout session maybe at six, seven, eight, thereabout. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it, it depends on the kind of fast we're talking about. But talking about this kind of fast, I, I, I'm not talking generally because I don't know when these people, when the, this particular person maybe stop eating or, or, or so. But the thing about fasting, anyhow you are doing it, is when you are, in, during that period, your routine can't be the same. It cannot be the same. Because let me tell you how the body works. Cannot or should not. Well, because when, you, when I say should not, the reason why, why I say cannot is because, of course, you can do it, and, but what, what will happen is that you will have an adverse effect. Mm. Okay? So they are playing the tennis throughout. Mm -hmm. But did you, if you go back to other things they do, do they go home and collapse? 
or do they go home and are still able to perform? I've said this here many times. Physical fitness is the ability for you to be able to, you know, with vigor and strength, be able to do your daily activity, whatever you do as a person. Mm -hmm. And when you're done with all those daily activity, you still have enough energy, yeah, for either leisure or emergency. That's what physical fitness, that's the definition of physical fitness. Of course, uh, the WHO will have, um, and not living uh, a, a terrible lifestyle, like drinking and smoking. But the point I'm trying to make here is this. Your body uses energy. What gives you energy is the food that you eat. So when you, when you are fasting, it means that you are depriving your body of immediate um, calories or uh, uh, energy mm. uh, called glycogen in your bloodstream that will help you wor work. And so even if you want to take from the stored um, fat that you have and, and all that, it, it, it must be a routine that is cardiovascular in nature that is not very intense. And so you gradually build your body back up to where you were before mm -hmm. or where you want to get to. Something you said earlier that I just want to draw attention to. So essentially you're saying that generally yeah. the body yeah. does not like sudden. No, no, it doesn't. No, no. So let me use one part of the body that is very important to explain this. It's the human heart. In exercise or in fitness, um, the human heart, the way it works is it has its own rhythm. It has its own beat. It, it works, um, you know, by itself. It's one of those things we call involuntary muscle. You don't have to do anything. It's working um, on, on its own. And um, what you find is that when you start a, an exercise routine, and you just go up. From zero to 100. Yeah, from zero to <laughs> 60 or to 100, you are in danger of hurting your heart. Or if you have any underlining sicknesses or issues, maybe for instance, you have plaques around your vessels. Mm. Yeah? What will happen is that all of a sudden, that vessel will pick up plaques and maybe block um, that pathway which, of course, will that cause heart attack or stroke, yeah, as we know. So when it comes to the heart, you, you have to gradually take it up. And even when it comes to finishing a routine, you have to gradually bring it down. Okay. So just let me just say, so when we're working, there's something we call warm-up phase yeah. or yeah. pulse razor phase. So yeah. when you start your workout, there's something called warm-up. But that warm-up is not the warm-up you know it as. Warm-up has in it three things. It has pulse razor, mobility, and stretches. So that, that pulse razor is really conditioning or preparing your heart to start a workout routine. Now, that is even when you are fit and, and you know, you're mm -hmm. not fasting. Mm -hmm. not, not to talk about now when you are fasting. You should gradually take up that heart rate. Yeah. Let it be where, you know, you're very mm -hmm. comfortable and then you bring it down. Most of the problems we have is that people don't know where they should stay. So don't shock your heart. No, yes. Don't, yeah. <laughs> they don't know where they don't should shock stay. It. So how about flight or fight circumstances? Yes. It happens suddenly, doesn't it? Yes. And then you decide to either run or jump or fight or something. Yes, yes. How, Essentially, the hormone that does that is the adrenaline in your body, okay. uh, which we call the f uh, fight or flight. Now, that doesn't happen every day, does it? Okay. Mm -hmm. You know, you are not constantly living a life where you wake up in your morning, you are, you are all jittered up. Yeah, and you find some people that because they are jumpy, all of a sudden they slump. Mm. You've had times where just shock. People are just in shock and they can't move or they are shaking or, you know, they, they have an issue. For, so that's not how to live. You can't be living that, that way. But that can happen once in a while. Mm. And your heart, if your heart is healthy, you can take it. But that, doesn't, that shouldn't be the way you are living your life, you know, yeah. you, you, the heart is not... Uh, it's not normal. No, it's, that's not the way the heart should work. It's yeah. sh gradual pace. And even when you're finishing an, a high-intensity workout, you should gradually reduce um, your pace as okay. you come down back to whatever you've been doing. Yeah. Okay. You should now, unwind. Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. You have wonderful phrases for this. <laughs> <laughs> no, just, just to be clear, yeah. um, to what Alero said earlier about some people working out during prolonged yeah. fasting periods. Yeah. Yeah. Someone, l l give us the minimum basic that someone okay. should have been involved in. Okay. And if the person has outdone himself or herself, mm -hmm. is there a 
Yes. A dial back. Yes. Yes. So we. I mean, um, thank you for this question because it is very important that we all know that intensity in exercise must be calculated at every given time. Mm. Okay. And as an exercise professional, what you do is that you have three ways you can actually measure that. But the first one, which you don't need to, uh, we don't need to talk about, um, is oxygen update um, uh, rate. Uh, that uses a lot of, you know, you need machines and, and all that. But there's also one called heart rate reserve, heart rate and heart rate reserve. And then there's one called rate of perceived exertion. Those two tools for measuring intensity does not need any equipment. Now, that first one, let me tell you how you ought to know what to do. Now, when you are exercising, you must always find out what is my maximum heart rate. What is the, 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 the number or the pulse rate per minute that my heart should get to when I'm exercising? So that means if my heart gets to, let's say, 180 beats per minute, should I be worried? Or should I know that I've gotten to a place where I need to come back low? Okay? Now, vis-a-vis, -vis, getting to a number like 60 and thinking that maybe, you've, maybe you get to maybe 80 or 90, or you're like, okay, since I'm on 90 and they've told us that our heart rate should not be too high, I think I'm doing great. <laughs> <laughs> so, in a sense, you have a place where you shouldn't go beyond, and you have a place where you should go beyond, mm -hmm. just so that you can be fit. Now, in between that spectrum at different levels of physical fitness, all having benefits to the human body. So, how do we check what our threshold is? So, let me tell you. So, if you're listening, write down 207. Now, this value I'm giving you now, so let me just say this. Normally, people will tell you 220 minus your age. Okay? I'm not, maybe you guys have heard that before. I'm sure some of the viewers have heard that before. Now, that number was given to us um, in 1971. And the research that brought out that, that figure for the maximum heart rate, are you with me? Yeah. Was, um, was not a very good... Um, uh, the, the, the sampling that was used was very fit athletes. And it was very, very small number. So years after, in 2001, there was, a tycoon, there was another person who did... Uh, there was a research that came out. But there's one we use now called Gillish. Okay. Now, this one I'm even talking to you about, it's not for everyone. If you have a lifestyle disease, there's a different number we will use. Okay. But just generically, if you have, if you are fit, if you are just normal, you look okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, no underlining you life. You look okay, you feel okay. You feel okay, Generally. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, you don't have any lifestyle disease. You're not obese or anything like that. Um, you can use the Gillish. The Gillish is more of 2007. Okay. And the Gillish formula is 207. Mm -hmm. Minus seventy percent of your age. Yeah, sorry about that. So what you need to find out first is if you are um, whatever your age is, get seventy percent. What is seventy percent of your age? If you have a calculator, what you can do is do zero point seven times your age. Zero point seven times your age. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> zero point seven, seven times, times your age. Uh huh. Now, subtract that number. From, just do minus mm -hmm. 207. It will give you a negative, but you, you, tip, you just use the number. 0 0.7. Okay. What did it give you? Minus 167. Good. So this 167, when you're exercising, must be your maximum heart rate. At that point, nothing will happen to you. You will, There won't be... Have you heard people that they, they do high intense stuff and they collapse? I hope you've, you've heard that. It's, yeah. it's, it was rampant. Uh, Somebody was just yeah, warming up. Warming, warming up. up, yes. And he and collapsed. Yes. So, now, th uh, knowing that number is quite important. Now, Please that say that again. Do for do for those of again. us who didn't get it. <laughs> 0 0.7. Mm -hmm. 0 0.7, mm -hmm. which is 70% really, mm -hmm. times your age. 0.7 times your age. Yes. 0 0.7 Seven times, times your, your age. Mm -hmm. Yes. Minus 207. I'm using a particular Minus formula that was formulated in 20, 2007. Yeah. Okay. Now, if you are 45, it's 251. Aha. Uh -huh. Now, let me, <laughs> let me, some, some, remember that too, that the, 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 this technique is called heart rate, heart rate reserve. Mm. Now, this number that you have gotten now, mm. the exercise professional, that's not all you need. Oh. The question is, no, let me tell you why. The question is, let's say, for instance, we are both, the same age, 
and we do the calculation, and our heart rate is the same, the question is, do we have the same exercise experience? If I've been, if I've, I've been sitting at home all day and you've been a long tennis player all your life, we can't be training at the same heart rate. Yeah. So aside from knowing that number, first of all, is that what do you do with the number? Now, I know this is my limit, so at least that helps you not to collapse. Yeah? So when you're in the gym, whatever people are doing, they are flying, they are, just check. <laughs> I have when reached you my limit. That, that you have gotten there, just calm down. Now, mm. I am not saying that the minute you meet that limit, you will collapse on the floor. But I'm saying that scientifically, if you get to that limit, you are already working the heart. So if, you, if I want to so walk my... Begin to unwind. Yeah, if I want to walk my generator, do I have to overwork it for it to perform properly? No. no. When I overwork it, it actually doesn't perform properly. But when I put the right, you know, appliances on the generator, it will work perfectly. Mm. Isn't it? So that's kind of the idea here. Your, your maximum heart rate just helps you to know, okay, this is where I, sh I shouldn't get to. Now, your heart rate reserve is now what tells you the minimum and the maximum to, to go on. And, and these are the things that are very, very important for all trainers to know. I, honestly, it is not your job to be calculating all these things. You, well, have your own, you have your own stuff. But the idea is that when you meet a professional, you should be able to say, okay, this is your art, maximum heart rate, yeah? Uh, this is the zone you should be training in. And then even calculate the amount of calories you are burning based off your workout. Very, very simple stuff to do, to calculate calories per workout. But you speak to the average person. person doesn't know how to do I'm talking about trainers now. But obviously, as I always say, as students, these are the things they are learning so that they can really bring value to people that come to them. So now, the next thing to do is a bit technical, and it's not for everyone. It's for fit professionals. There's a formula that we use to calculate the heart rate reserve. It's called the Kevonian theory, but don't worry about it. So it's... Um, you take that value, maximum, your maximum heart rate, uh, you calculate it vis-a-vis uh, -vis your resting heart rate times, you know, your age, blah, blah, blah. Now, the reason why I'm saying all that is <laughs> at least knowing your maximum heart rate, at, at least it helps you. But what the professional then does is that it takes that data and uses that data with another calculation, uh, the Kevonian especially, uh, globally accepted by exercise professionals and uh, scientists and uses it to get what we call your heart rate reserve. So, meaning this is the minimum you should work out with for, for your heart to be developing. Because you can be working out and your heart is actually not developing. You, you are not actually pushing it to, to its limits in such a way that you get the, the, the benefits that you want from it. And so that is important. This is overdoing it and not working out. Now, you may ask me, which I just quickly want to say, that what's the benefit of getting it right? Now, the heart itself has what we call cardiovascular output or cardiac output, meaning that the quantity of blood that your heart pumps into your body in a minute. So a good example is this. Theoretically, the human heart pumps about four liters of blood per minute. Yeah, that's what it does. Now, if your heart is weak, we call it the LV, the, uh, the side of the heart that pumps the oxygenated blood. When it is weak, if it's supposed to pump four liters, for, for example, in 30 beats, are you with me? Mm -hmm. Because it is weak, it can only Less. pump maybe two liters in that one minute. It will have to beat 60 times to achieve four liters. Am I making sense? Mm -hmm. So when your heart is not strong and you're not training it at a level where there's development, where capillaries are growing around it and it's developing and it's strong and the muscles around it are strong and they can pump, what happens is that you will quick, you'll quickly come up with, you know, a cardiac disease or a cardiac um, dis dysfunction. Condition. Yeah. You will, you know, your heart will not be performing as it should, which will affect your entire body, which will affect how well you even live your life. So that's important. I just said that so that you know the importance of ensuring that you... Your heart rate is at the right place. Let me when remind you. It. Let me remind you of the simple question I asked. Okay, sorry. <laughs> so, <are you> <laughs> saying, <laughs> simple question I asked. Yes. You. Those who have overdone it. Yes. Overdone during yeah. fasting. Yes. Is there a comeback? So. And those who need to ease back in. Mm. That's who will now, you know, be speaking to them.
how do we get but for, for those who have overdone it overdone their workout they would work out during fasting yes okay. allow me to say a, a, a pigeon word body go tell you mm. body go tell you means that if you don't have enough energy and you go and do high intensity exercise if you, i don't care who you are you will be fatigued and your eyes technically, will begin to see yeah, something. and you say people say you know they, they were feeling dizzy. <laughs> you 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 can't do that. Okay, the body works with energy, so those people naturally they will work. not be able to work out as often as they've been doing or do other and, things, and so they, they will just te technically just come back to try to rest, which can be discouraging. They may think, oh, I'm not performing as I should. I'm not eating those shots as I, as I should. And so there may, there may be some discouragement from that. But what you know, I'll encourage them to do is to go back gradually. So how do we now go back gradually? Yes. Fasting, now fasting is You're over. You're done, yes. Uh, both Fantastic. The religions are yes. done with the intense 40 days and 30 days <laughs> of fasting. Uh, and um, some have even plunged into eating the yes. way they normally do. I was going do. to talk about that first. Mm -hmm. Okay. So what happens usually during fasting is that we fitness trainers um, get into trouble. Why? By the time we come back and do a physical assessment for our, for, our, for our trainers, they've lost stamina, they've lost balance, they've lost stability, they've lost even the will to eat meat. Okay? Because it's like a revenge. <laughs> I was starved for this amount of days. And revenge. I'm now going to show my body. Revenge against Self food. Is food. That I can do it. And you know, you tell yourself things like, I always tell my students, there's nothing like cheat day. It doesn't exist. It's, it's a meat that makes you go back to the food. Please say it again. There's nothing like cheat day. Say it one more time. <laughs> to, to use Let's, the Zebrudea's language, told them. <laughs> the, the problem that people have is that they are trying to give you reward for your hard work. But they don't know that cheat days is not reward. Cheat day is more like um, taking you back to where you were before. No, but the thing is... But that le, le, let me just... Okay, go ahead. If you haven't been eating, well, if you have been fasting, yes. your body gets used to the fast. Okay. So your body is now used to not having food between 5 a.m. and 7 p.m. Fantastic. Oh, before, so when you now midnight. want to start eating, yes. your body will be asking for the food gradually. There's no way I, you can just jump no. into oh, eating so three square meals a day. Yeah, not just three square. Six. Uh, yeah, like six circle or rectangular meals <laughs> that people are able to do. The problem... Some, you know, can the body that? really take that? Food is not just physiological, it's also psychological. No, sorry, sorry. Can the body really take that? <laughs> it begins with, can the mouth take, take it? Take it! Let me give you an example. <laughs> do you know in this part of the world, we eat till we are full? Uh, do, you, do you know that? I, I grew up like that. We eat till we are full. Yeah, I mean, when I'm eating, you say, ah, mommy, I'm not full. And somehow, in your mind, you think that when you are full is when you have eaten. But when you are done eating, you find out that you want to sleep. L let's not even go to food today. Because you have overeaten. Because you have overeaten. So, do, do you know that most people that struggle with obesity, they struggle with obesity from the point of uh, stress. And so they are trying to, so it's emotional. They are trying to kick away stress. And so they are just eating. They are just eating. They are just eating. They're just eating. They call it stress eating. Yeah. And it's not about the belly anymore. No. Uh, the stomach anymore. Yeah. It's, it's just emotional. So food has three things in it. Actually, physiological, you have the psychological, and you have the art. Some people just enjoy certain meals. It might be very small, but that is what they want to eat. Yeah? They love the way it looks, and so it appeals to them. I have so, a friend that I know who just loves a particular soda. It's black. Go ahead. <laughs> That's not what I'm talking about. No. <laughs> <laughs> that was something else. You know, that, that I'm, one is, I'm not looking at you. That, say I'm only looking at you, right? That's for uh, sugar. Uh, yeah, forget. If okay. that brand goes, they will move to another brand. Okay. Straight away. Straight. They are not loyal to that <laughs> brand. It's, if they can make it locally, you know. Thank God we cannot make that, those things locally. They will make it in their house. So it's not the brand. It's that... I know, I know. I'm just, I'm just saying. Yeah. And I'm, you see, I'm only looking at you. Yes, yes, I know. No, okay. We are just okay. looking at each other. There's mm. nobody else. Anyway, mm. by the way... <laughs> um, by by yeah. the way, so as we we're saying... Yes. So, Yes, yes, as we're saying, mm. what you should do, obviously, I'm, I'm sure you, most people know this, is you start with fruits, okay? Start with, you know, things that are not fried and overcooked and just gradually go back. So if you've not been eating for those hours, you should 
maybe eat once in between those hours the first day mm -hmm. the second day increase it to just maybe your portion a bit just gradually phase yourself into those things now the reality is most of the people that fasted they, they're not necessarily living a, life, a healthy lifestyle they've been eating all their food uh, they are not really checking it's those who have been li living a lifestyle that will take opportunity of this fasting and be like okay now that i'm fasting this is a good time to do this to or do that. this and because they are aware of their health and so they will take a good use of the fast and not just plunge back into food but 90% of the people who do this are not really looking at their, their they, they've suffered, <laughs> you know, and suffered. the suffering is over. <laughs> and so it's time to let the food know that I'm master. Baba. You know, okay. And so they jump. Okay. So that's Baba. for the food. Now for the exercise, as <laughs> you said, it is as you build a house, you go back and you check your foundations. You, you go back to your balance. You go back to your stamina. You go back to checking, of course, doing a full fitness assessment before you know what to do, and then you gradually go back. And you want to start with exercise, as I said before, that are, that are between low to mid intensity. Mm. For the first one to two weeks, there shouldn't be any high intense uh, exercises that you're doing. Uh, the, the thing is, we're so much in a hurry. I don't know where we're going to. Uh, but if, as long as you're not you know, you know, training for an Olympic that's next week, just take it easy. Go to the gym, do mid to low intensity exercises, um, for that time, and then do exercises that are not high impact in nature. Those are two different things. The minute you're able to do that, you will find that in the f coming weeks, your body is now ready, mm. you know, to do more. And then you will not be demotivated by, maybe by injury or by uh, ability of not to perform your exercise. For instance, if you plan to do uh, eight reps of an exercise and you're only able to do six, there's a way your mind begins to tell you you're not able but when you're planning to do eight and you can do nine you're pumped you're like yeah i can do more but that happens when you know where you are mm -hmm. and you're training based on where you are okay and so those elements have what to do i can go into specifics but i just want to mention those two things you know just to um uh, i know that we're running out of time but yeah. i came across this thing they call the daily 50s mm -hmm. have you come across them daily 50 yes so um there are very few things that you can do you s uh, stand up sit down oh, okay. um you pump yourself on a chair yeah. 10 times yeah. you stand against a wall yeah. uh, with your oh. knee you know uh, that 90 degree stand yeah uh, 10 wall, seconds wall yeah. yeah wall squats and all those things and oh. then you lift your you know yeah 10 10 times, well, yeah. one is 10 seconds, well, two of them are 10 seconds, yeah. one of the three others are 10 push-ups. They call them the daily 50s. That's how how, prof how profitable or productive are those on the body? I, I am a, a champion for physical activity. Anything that gets you off the bed, off the chair, and to move a bit faster, and for it is physical activity. And so that, uh, what you call it now? Daily 50. Daily 50 is good because 50s. we. It's a good thing because we live in a day where everyone is seated. They're at home. The kitchen is just right there. Yeah. And they are walking from home. You get the point. And um, uh, nobody's moving anymore. Nobody's moving anymore. So, such things are good. But don't confuse physical activity with physical fitness. Hmm. That is not the same thing. Whatever you're doing is good. But you can do better. And with better is physical fitness. Physical fitness is measured, is prescribed, is repeatable, is measurable, it's specific. You have an actual physical fitness goal that you are trying to achieve. And based on that goal, you are doing certain things, yeah, with different principles of exercise to achieve those things. That's physical fitness. But yeah, so um, yeah, so go ahead and do that. But if you're obese or you have a lifestyle disease and you do the fifties, uh, the daily fifties all day. Some people are hung on these things. Yeah, yeah, you can be hung on it. But the problem is, if you have a lifestyle disease or you ha there's a particular intensity you need to be working out in, let's say for weight loss, you will maybe you might if, if you're forty, be careful that you don't go at that fifty. Oh, Joe. Yeah. Is your wife also an exercise freak? Freak out. No, 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 no. This is my profession. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. Does she join you no. in uh, exercising? 
well, my, my schedule is too tight for me to do it. For you to do from time to time, that happens. But the, 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 I don't she's, know why you're asking me. Should I, I, I learned how to ask you okay, why. Okay, yeah, go ahead. What? You, what? No, I just want to know if uh, is she slim? <laughs> what? Well, physical fitness, I've said it here, it's not about whether you're slim. No, I'm, I, I answer my question now. Uh, well, you I don't have, want you, to know whether she's fit. You I need want the, to know whether she's slim. No, you need oh, their wedding picture. The beauty is in the eye of the beholder. So whatever I tell you, you have to take it. Yes, you tell. So tell yeah, me. Yeah, she's. Uh, mm -hmm. Of course, she is. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Even if she's obese. Mwah. What's your she's own? Mwah. 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 So Obesity you still haven't told us why you. No, mwah. no. I didn't say she's obese. So oh. <laughs> don't go there. Mm -hmm. So let me say this. Does she fact, exercise? Yes, as well. I didn't want to say it, but if you know, if a woman just gives birth, there's a time. That you can't be as active as you used to. True. So True. Those are, there are such yeah. times oh, okay. when people shouldn't yes. exercise, right? Yes. You've talked about two of them today now. One of such times that they shouldn't exercise as intensely. Yes. Is when you're you're yeah. fasting, fasting. you're fasting, or, or when you just give birth. Yeah. So giving birth now. You should, but that, they, they have another routine exercise. altogether. Exactly. In fact, it's that that's should, when. The, the, they That's when you need to exercise the before most. and after. Now, <laughs> but it doesn't mean that you go for a Taibo class or a heat class, you know, the very intense classes. Oh, yeah. It doesn't mean that you're now joining a marathon because someone told you that. No. You, should, you get the point. So you see that even just looking at, you know, being pregnant, there is the type mm -hmm. and the intensity and the frequency. Different from the normal. Yes, that is different. So... For such people, there are exercises that... Because it they, will help you during yes, child's birth that's, anyway. Uh, yes. So, <clears throat> there are exercises that they, they, they are prescribed exercises. Yes. That they will do post, pre, and post giving birth. So, you, you might not be able to follow me to the gym, but in the house, they are active. They are moving about. They are carrying their kids. They are mm. doing those things. And, is, there, uh, is, there, is there any... My apologies. Is there any chance that during fasting... Yes. Uh, when someone has to cut down on, on the yes. intensity of exercises... Some quote unquote debilitating illnesses may show up. That maybe because you cut down on certain activities, something suddenly came up that you were that were being masked before. Well, I, I think that's possible, but okay. that would be something that maybe a, a doctor will now be able to speak to uh, okay. about. But um, from my own point of view, uh, the fasting period is not you know, like six months or that kind of thing. The things that happen during these times is that you kind of lose your routine. Mm -hmm. That's usually mm -hmm. what happens, which one I'm talking about. If you are someone that usually goes to the gym a lot and um, you stopped going to the gym because of the fast, instead of <coughs> reducing your intensity. You not know, cutting it out. To not cutting it No, no. If that's, what, that's not what I've said. I've, so if you're fasting, I'm not saying don't go to there. I'm saying when you go there, you can't keep doing what you've been doing before. Reduce your intensity and stay active and fit. But when you're done with that, don't just go back to where you were before. Gradually move away from there back to where yeah. you want to be. Okay. That, that's what I'm saying. Okay. You know? So um, if you are someone who uh, during the fast you were you know, going to the gym a lot, what, what can happen if your intensity was high is that you may be demotivated because maybe you feel dizzy or those kinds of things. But I don't think they can be a, an illness. Okay. Something that will need maybe like medical, except there was an underlining that was, that that was there before and then uh, you not eating just brings it up, which okay. will be a doctor's job. But together. aside from that, there is, there is okay. really... You know, they, I, I like to talk about this. Again, I go back to young people. Um, there is the assumption that young people have the energy naturally. Mm. Um, <laughs> Is that assumption correct? And what, how, sh how important is fitness even for them as young people, even though they have all the energy? First of all, that is not true. I think it's in Japan. They don't just retire you because you're 60. They retire you based on your physical fitness test. Uh -huh. Yes. There are people who are 28. I've, I've worked with them, 28, 30. They have serious life-threatening lifestyle diseases. Oh. There's someone we posted on our social media platform. It's a woman, in, I think, in the U.S. She's, I think she's around the 70s, and she just did, a, she just broke a world record for the longest plank exercise, something that a young person can't even do. She just did it. So physical fitness has nothing to do with your age. Uh, recently, when I was at the 
um, uh, there's a meeting we usually have, uh, fitness professionals usually have globally, and this meeting was in Spain. And one of the things that we, we discussed in that meeting is this idea that people over 50, is usually even more stereotyped around 60, the minute you're over 60, there are some exercises you shouldn't do. You now become this fragile, um, able to just easily break that's not kind true. of person. That's not true. Yeah. And, and you see people treat people that way okay. as though, you know, they, they are fine. And then the young people, you think that they can do it, and then before you know it, they're on the floor. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. so, it's there's, a lot of messages long on X. Yeah. 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 It's mm -hmm. what you've been doing. A, a quick, quick feedback? Uh, yes. Um, Alain Rewaju says on X, prices not coming down borders on patriotism and the failure of the system. I beg, government, get work to do. Yeah, we, we took that Tell earlier. us about it. Well, I guess, I guess that has a way of affecting the way people do whatever they do. Has the rebound affected the prices of fuel and diesel? <laughs> Good question. Well, well, they say it's affected diesel. Mm. Joel Zamere, mm. Chief Executive Officer, Institute of Registered Exercise Professionals. Thank you again for being here this morning. It's always, always exciting when you're here. Thank you. Always Thank a you delight. At least you Thank have you. not told Arlera not to eat. <laughs> Well, she knows what to do. No, he can tell me not to eat, as long as he doesn't tell me not to eat cake. <laughs> mm, yeah, so that's our program for today, please. Let's, uh... Let's not eat Ayo, cake. Ayo, be careful. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Alero Edu, and I wish you all the best until we bring you a fresh edition next Saturday. See you then. And I'm Ayo Makine. Do have a wonderful rest of your weekend. <laughs>